Council meeting of October 15th, 2019. We will start this morning with a um, chaplain prayer, and Ed Lopez is going to lead us in that prayer. Good morning, Honorable Mayor Gunter, distinguished members of the City Council staff, and the fine citizens of San Angel. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you this morning thanking you, Father, for the opportunity we have to live a new day and to serve your kingdom. We thank you for the freshness and the crisp air in the morning, Lord, the cooler weather. Now we ask you, Father God, that you give wisdom from above to all of our city council this morning as they make decisions that will affect the citizens of San Angelo. We ask you, Father God, that you place your hedge of protection around our city and keep us safe. And Father God, now we ask you that you just continue to bring blessings upon our wonderful home that we call San Angelo. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This morning we have Angelo Catholic School student, second grader Blaze. How do you say your name? Blaze, that is such a cute name. Do people tease you about that all the time? Oh, your Buckner is your last name. Do they tease you about that one too? They do? Well, we're not gonna tease you today. We're gonna welcome you today with also with seventh grader Riley Buckner. So please come forward and lead us in, in our pledges today. Come on. This morning we have one proclamation, and it is a proclamation of October 23rd through 31st, 2019, as Red Ribbon Week. Substance use disorders particularly damaging to one of our most valuable resources, our children, and is a contributing factor in three leading cases of death for teenagers, accidents, homicides, and suicides. It is imperative that visible, unified prevention education efforts by community members be launched to eliminate the demand for drugs. It is the goal of Red Ribbon Week and the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Council for the Concho Valley to involve families, schools, businesses, churches, law enforcement agencies, and service organizations in all aspects of this campaign and establish an atmosphere that supports awareness, education, and ongoing initiatives to prevent illegal drug use. The Red Ribbon Week campaign theme promotes family and individual responsibilities for living healthy, drug-free lifestyles without illegal drugs or the illegal use of legal drugs. There are many activities planned during the Red Ribbon Week campaign in Tom Green County. The Alcohol and Drug Abuse Council for the Concho Valley and Concho Valley Cares are asking the residents of the city of San Angelo to observe Red Ribbon Week, October 23rd through 31st, 2019. Therefore, I, Brenda Gunter, mayor of the city of San Angelo, Texas, on behalf of the city council, do hereby proclaim October 23rd through October 31st, 2019 as Red Ribbon Week 2019 in San Angelo, Texas, and call upon all residents, parents, governmental agencies, public and private institutions, businesses, hospitals, schools, and colleges in the city of San Angelo to support and increase community awareness and prevention efforts in our community. I know we have several folks here um, to accept this proclamation, so if you would please come forward. Good 
morning. Um, thank you, city council members and everyone in attendance for having us here today to proclaim Red Ribbon Week in San Angelo and in the Concho Valley. My name is Courtney Bingham and I'm the prevention director at ADAC. And I have some of our um, other leadership team here. We have our CEO, Eric Sanchez, Melissa Madrid, our HR director, and Jennifer Flores, our CCP coordinator. <laughs> Excuse me. Red Ribbon Week is a fun and important week that gives us the opportunity to remind students of the importance of staying drug free and working towards a safe, healthy, and productive life. Please join us starting next week as we begin celebrating Red Ribbon Week and remind the students in our lives that this week is not just about wearing crazy socks or their favorite pajamas. <laughs> Excuse me. This week is to honor the dedication and ultimate sacrifice that DEA agent Kiki Camarena made in the 80s to help make our community safer and drug free. This year's national theme is send a message, stay drug free. It is a simple reminder for youth that by staying drug free, they are sending a message to themselves and others that they value themselves, their overall health and their community, their community and their future. So thank you again for having us here today and help us celebrate next week um, as we celebrate Red Ribbon Week. So thank you. With that, we will move into public comment. I should have reminded everybody a little earlier to please look at your phone and make sure it's on vibrate or silent. Public comment. Please state your name and address and your SMD area. Each citizen can speak just once per item unless asked to comment by council. Public comment will be three minutes unless extended by council or translation services, and the proponent or opponent is five minutes unless extended by council or translation services. Council has no obligation to respond to comments or questions from the public. Any response from a member of the city council to non-agenda items is limited to a statement of specific factual information, recital of existing policy, and directing staff to place the subject on a future agenda. Do we have any public comment this morning? Please come forward. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I, my name is B.A. Reed. I was a longtime resident of Lake Nasworthy, so I'm very glad I don't have any leased property out there. I see that on the agenda this morning. Uh, moved downtown, so I live down in Santa Fe Park Drive area now. I do not know what district that's in, so I can tell you that's my address, so I have no <laughs> idea right now. I'm going to take just a brief moment or two, and I want to bring something to the attention of the members of the council. You may be aware of it already. Perhaps if you are, great. If you're not, then you'll learn something quickly. This is about the oldest golf courses in America and Texas. Golf's birthplace occurred in the 15th century in Scotland, around the area of the Firth of Forth on the North Sea of St. Andrews, Scotland. In 1497, the game was created by sheep herders who found that playing the game helped pass the time of day. Played continuously for over 525 years, with the exception of about 45 years when a Scottish king banned playing the game because the youth were not practicing their archery as they needed. Upon the king's death, the game resumed and spread across the planet Earth. So it arrived in America in the 19th century, with the oldest golf courses registered were in Foxborough, Pennsylvania, and Oakhurst, West Virginia. Both those courses opened for play in 1884. In Texas, the Hancock course, which was started by the first mayor of Austin, opened a nine-hole golf course with 11 members in the club. 
It was in the year 1899. This same location later became the home of the Austin Country Club. In 1916, Brackenridge Park in San Antonio, Texas opened the first 18-hole golf course to play. To this day, it's considered the oldest course that has had uninterrupted and continuous play since its inception in Texas. However, and the reason why I'm here this morning, one year early, earlier than 1916 and 1915, a nine-hole golf course was up on the banks of the Concho River in San Angelo, Texas. The land was gifted by the Santa Fe Railroad to the city of San Angelo, and a golf course was created and play began. Even though records regarding golf courses in America are speculative and not totally absolute, probably at best, it is evident that the San Angelo Santa Fe golf course is one of the oldest continuously operating golf courses in the state of Texas. I believe that our city should recognize it, should take pride in it, and should publish perhaps a historical treasure that exists on the humble banks of our Concho River. Thank oh, you I very much. Say, you're welcome. Do I have any further public comment? Good morning, Mayor Gunner. Good um, morning. Members of City Council, Councilman Hebert. My name is Alan Prest. I'm a resident of District 1. I live in Southland Hills. I'm here to ask Council uh, how the city decided to no longer record four boards and commissions. Uh, that decision was made six months ago. Uh, I found that out when I returned from a trip and I was interested in watching the Animal Services Advisory Committee and it was not available for me to view. The public can no longer watch on Channel 17 or on the city's YouTube channel four boards. They are the Water Advisory Board, which only meets when y'all charge it to meet, uh, Civic Events Advisory Board, Animal Shelter Advisory Committee, and Parks and Recreation Advisory Board. And um, after noticing those meetings were no longer recorded, I did contact Mayor Gunner, and you were kind enough to reply, and thank you. And uh, the mayor did indicate that she was not aware of the change in, in that her communication with me. Um, I have learned the city does not have a policy on recording board meetings for the public to view. It does have a practice and that's available on its website. And that practice changed uh, six months ago today. During a recent discussion on the frequency of one board's meeting, city manager Daniel Valenzuela said, it's what city council prefers from an advisory board. It's clear council wasn't consulted before uh, the decision was made to drop uh, video public access for those four boards. Uh, many of you ran on transparency and openness in government. And I believe that's been uh, reduced by, that, by staff's action. And so I encourage council to explicitly shine some light on this, the rationale for the decision to stop. And if council wishes the public to continue to hear the advice uh, that you receive in these uh, boards and their deliberations, uh, I would be grateful for that information. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. More public comment? I'm Rick Abbott, 32-year uh, 32 32-year resident of Lake Nasworthy, so I guess I'm up here today as the sacrificial lamb of the Homeowners Association. First, I would like to commend our former council back in the early 90s that created the Lake Nasworthy Trust Fund, and I believe Mr. Hebert, you had served at that time, which showed the wisdom of our former councilman to create an account to have money to do things. And so I really commend that council at that time. I commend this current council that has taken on the responsibility of exercising what these prior councilmen had established, and that is spending the money that ha has now been built up in this account. As far as our Lake Nasworthy Homeowners Association, we're behind y'all 100% in backing this issue. As we see this, this is a $15 million plus project for in improvements, infrastructure improvements to Southwest San Angelo, be it sewer, be it lake improvements, it's improvements to our city which is not gonna cost any taxpayer a dime in this city, and I think the city would, would be real wise to express that to the voters that this is a unique election that we're coming upon, and the fact that you're asking the voter 
to spend money that's not going to cost them anything. And the fact there's no interest on that cost. And I really think you're, you're leading in the right direction and I'm, we're behind you 100%. We would hope that we could become part of that component when it comes down to the point of spending the money if it passes and some have some, have some input in what we're gonna do on these projects at the lake. But once again, we just wanna thank you for going forward with this project. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Further public comment? With no further public comment, we will close this section of the agenda and we will move into the consent agenda. And with that, I'm going to start with Tommy Hebert. Do you have anything you want to pull from the consent? No, ma'am. Tom? No, ma'am. Harry? No, ma'am. Billy? Uh, item L, ma'am. Okay, item L. <clears throat> Lane? No, ma'am. Lucy? No, ma'am. And I'm going to pull M and N. So with that, may I have a motion to approve the consented agenda with the exception of items L, M, and N. So moved, ma'am. With the move by Harry, a second by Billy. All in, any public comment? No public comment, we'll take a vote. All in support of passing the consent agenda with the exception of items L, M, and N. Say aye. 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 With none opposed, motion passes 7-0. We'll move into item L, which is consider approving a memorandum of understanding between the City of San Angelo and Downtown San Angelo, Inc. for the construction of an entryway into Downtown San Angelo. You're on today. Good. Good. It's Good morning, not Shane, Mayor but it's, it's not Shane. It's, Shane is uh, taking a well-deserved vacation right great. this week, so Thank. I'm going to try to fill his boot, boots for today. Thank All you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick, thank you so much. Um, a couple of questions. Um, when we made the decision to redo Concho Street, or that block, that portion of Contra, Concho Street, um, it was my understanding, I believe, that we moved that up on the priority list because we got some funding from um, TxDOT or somebody, and we wanted to take advantage of, of that. Is, can that, is, that is correct. That particular intersection right there at Concho and Cohenheim, uh, has been on TxDOT's list. That intersection has been uh, the privilege of having many accidents in it. Um, the, that one uh, section of signal pole has been hit many times and it was uh, in the need of replacement. So TxDOT had put some money toward that replacement and in that um, reconfiguration of that, it tied very well into uh, the reconstruction of that street at this time. So yes, that reconstruction did get pushed up in the priority list. Um, although it was on the list uh, from the very beginning. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. And then another question. In reviewing the archway and all, mm -hmm. will the um, DHRC, am I saying that right? Will Design they Historic will, Review Committee. Yeah. Yes. Will they review and approve that arch since it is in the downtown area? It will be. So downtown San Angelo um, is the spearhead for this archway. Um, they're providing all the funding, all the design, and all the cost of construction along with that. The city will just assume ownership after it's constructed. But um, the design elements of the archway um, staff has worked very closely with Dale and, and downtown to ensure that there's some consistency with the architecture and the historic uh, elements all the way through downtown. So it, it, sh it should have a seamless transition, or that's our goal is to have a seamless transition from uh, as you enter that downtown uh, gateway. And then one final thing. Um, as I read the background information, it seemed to be very clear that downtown San Angelo, Inc. would bear the full cost of this arch. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So all my question. So I make a motion that we approve this item. Perfect. And a second by Lucy. Um, any public comment? With none, we'll take a vote. All in favor of approving item L, say aye. 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 With none opposed, mo motion passes 7-0. Item N, consider approving tax increment reinvestment zone tiers incentive funding for four private projects in the North Tiers area for the properties located at 1715 North Chadburn, 1816 North Chadburn, 1822 North Chadburn, and 2934 North Chabern, totaling $233,985.
I just want for the public to understand these specific projects. So if you would just review what those projects are. Good morning. Shannon Scott, Business Retention and Expansion Coordinator for the city. Uh, the first project that was approved is at 1715 North Chadburn. Uh, this was for a facade grant uh, in the amount of $9 uh, for a company called JKLS Properties. The next project was uh, 1816 North Chadburn. Uh, this will also be for facade work, uh, landscaping, paving, and new signage. And this was approved in the amount of $75,000. And that will actually be a, um, a salon called The Gentleman. So that will be the, the new business entity going in there. Uh, next project was at 1822 yes, North Chadburn. Just Chabber. a minute. Oh, Billy, go I ahead. You sure can. Um, Shannon, would you also cover, in the event someone hasn't looked at the background information, the match amount that these um, companies are willing to put in this and the total project cost sure. of this? So, you know, it's not that um, the tiers is fully funding it, but you know the um, owners of these establishments have an investment as well. So as part of the tiers policy, um, any project in the North Zone that's over $10,000 requires a minimum 25% match. Uh, so the first project at 1715 North Chadburn, being that it was under the $10,000 for 9,080, they did not require a match. The one at 1816 North Chadburn, uh, the total project cost is $140,900. So as part of that 25% minimum match, um, we're looking at around 18,000 or so, but they're actually putting in about 65,000 of their own money as part of that match. So the next project is 1822 North Chadburn. Uh, that's Senior Chang's, that's actually an existing business currently, but they are moving to this new location. Um, again, the total project cost on this is about $255,000. Uh, and as part of that minimum required match, they were only uh, required to put up about 18,000, but they're putting up almost 180,000 of their own money. Uh, so the amount that they are receiving is just a little bit under the 75,000. Um, and similar to the 1822, this is going to be for facade work, uh, landscaping, paving, and those types of improvements. Uh, the final project that was approved is at 2934 North Chadburn, and that is at Dollar General. So again, a, a pretty substantial project, uh, costing around $100,000 total. Uh, 75,000 was approved for uh, uh, facade work, landscaping and paving, and then of course as part of their match, they're putting up the 25,000. Yes, Harry. And in, in a couple of these cases, these buildings are empty, is that correct? Uh, yes, sir, the, the one at, um, let's see. The 1715 North Chadburn is currently occupied. Uh, the two at 1816 and 1822 are vacant, uh, but they will be occupied again by a restaurant uh, and by the salon. Uh, the 18, I'm sorry, the 2934 is the Dollar General, so that is currently occupied, but the two, um, the 1822 and the 1816 are currently vacant, but will be occupied. I think the point I'm trying to make is, is getting people into empty buildings in San Angelo helps put more money on the tax rolls. And I think this is something that we really uh, should also be working for. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. I'm excited about it because they, we've had the money in the Northern Tiers Fund and we've had very few people apply. So the fact that um, these um, individuals and these buildings are gonna come back into play and really improve um, those streets, I think that's an exciting thing. Absolutely. Um, the Northern Tiers, um, has looked for projects. We've, I think there's been a lot of effort to try to find people to do these projects. So um, I'm really excited about this opportunity and I can't wait to see the changes that this money will allow to have happen. So it's good. Any other questions from council? Okay, with that, Harry, would you like to make a motion to approve it? Certainly, make a motion to approve as presented. Second. second. A second by Lucy. Any public comment? No public comment. We will take a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 None opposed. Motion passes 7-0. <coughs> Item N, consider approving the following. One, second reading of an ordinance amending Appendix A, <laughs> fee schedule in the Code of Ordinances and requires a fee schedule to be adopted by resolution of council. 
two, a resolution approving the schedule of fees and charges, and three, a resolution approving the budget policy. Uh, Teresa and Tina, I guess this is yours. What I want to make sure this is, and if it's not, then I want to pull it for uh, a consideration down the road. These are just the resolutions. These aren't the actual fees within these resolutions. It's a resolution about policy, not about dollar amount. Um, that's correct. The first thing that we're doing is passing an ordinance that removes the fees from the Code of Ordinances. The second thing is just adopting the fees as they are currently within the Code of Ordinances. And then the third thing is um, approving a budget policy that kind of sets the process by which fees will be increased in the future. So Tina can speak a little bit more as to how that's going to work, but any deviation from the policy will have to be brought back to council um, for consideration. So the question on item two, um, it, is a, it is consideration of actual dollar amount of fees? Yes, but it's the fees that are already in place. There's Just no changes. Removing from the ordinance, putting them into a resolution. Yes. But what policy. I want to do is then move it to a future meeting because, in fact, the Development Task Force is still working with the Home Builders Association on their fees. And so I don't want this to go into effect until those conversations have been finalized and those fees re-looked at because there's several things that they are re-looking at. Actually, my recommendation would be to go ahead and approve this today. And the reason I say that is once we remove the fees from the ordinance, um, then they only need one reading to be changed. So since we're going to be adopting what's in place anyway, if you wait to approve removing these from the Code of Ordinances, any changes to the fees are going to require two readings versus just one. So we can bring it back next time for consideration of adjusting any of the fees that are on the fee schedule currently, but those fees on this fee schedule are the ones that went into place October 1st. So we're currently under this fee schedule. Um, Bob, when um, in the development task force meeting, is it Bob or, or Al Torres? John, when John are, James. Um, I just need to make sure I understand what the time frame is on working through the fees with the home builders and development community. We don't really have a, a time frame. Um, we've talked with them over uh, the past few meetings on fee schedules. Uh, but as you may recall, back when we proposed the new fees, I guess it was back in the summer, um, there had been agreement um, with the Home Builders Association on those fees. I think the only outstanding question is what this long-term policy is. Um, you know, it used to be at, our goal was to get to 75% of the cost, and now the new policy, as you, you all recommended in the summer, was to take that to 100% of the cost. Um, but at, at this point, we don't really have any um, current discussions going on with that group. I'm confused because I thought you told me last week that there were conversations going on. In fact, one of them was trying to change it from having a lot of individual fees to coming up with a lump sum fee instead of nickel and diming on every line item that you would have a set dollar amount that would be inclusive and not pick yeah, detail by detail. Actually, so that would be one that yes. is. And so if we approve this and these fees go into effect as of October 1st, then you've now made that decision to go forward without this new consideration. These fees are already in effect. They went into effect a couple weeks ago. So any changes that the development task force is proposing, if you approve all this today, and Tina can discuss what the budget policy says regarding future increases, but if you approve all of this today, then it just requires one reading to come back and change any of those development fees. If we don't approve this today, then we can't do anything about those fees today. If we brought them back next week, that would be first reading, and the next week would be second reading. I thought so, you just said that these fees were all in, already in effect. They are in effect. If you want to change them at any point, it'll take two readings right now. But if you adopt it all today, then it only takes one reading when they come back for any changes. So we're going to move forward with the existing fees, even though there's been many meetings of consideration with the home builders and the developers about re-looking at these fees and how we apply them. 
they were supportive of this year's change in fees. So I think what we're talking about with them are future years. And you're right, we have talked with them about consolidating some of the home building fees instead of having separate building permit, plumbing, mechanical, electrical fees, lumping it all into one fee. But that's a longer term discussion that we had planned to include in next year's fee review. Um, now, as I said, th they're not they're not aware of that conversation. They thought we were going to hold off in discussing these and relooking at these dollar amounts until we had relooked at their suggestion. My understanding was that they were fine with what Teresa called numbers one and two on today's agenda. What they had some concerns about was that new policy, which was number three uh, on that list. Um, and, and again they were fine with the fee increases that went into place this summer. They're concerned about that policy going forward um, in terms of the 100% cost recovery. But if you recall on the schedule we had, it will take three more years to, to get to that 100%. So we have time to have those discussions with them uh, because they were okay with this year's fee increase and next year's proposed fee increase. Uh -huh. It was only that third and fourth year where there were some concerns. And so, again, I think we have time to have those conversations with them um, because it was only those longer-term increases that they had some concerns about. So the fees that are in effect today actually were approved on second reading on May 21st, but they didn't become effective until October 1st. So that was all the fee work we did last spring. So you're going to continue to work with them to relook at all of these fees and find an easier, quicker, less complicated approach to yes. developing fees for Absolutely. the development community. Yes. And our time frame on doing that would be? Well, there's, uh, again, there's two different issues. One is this longer term, do we get to 100% fee recovery or do we get to the 75% fee recovery? Um, that'll be a discussion, I think, that we would have during next year's fee review and next spring. Um, but similarly, the disc separate discussion on consolidating home building fees into one fee instead of the multiple fees, uh, that's something we had also planned to bring back in the fee review next spring. Um, our intent was not to bring back anything before then. Again, since the Home Builders Association had already endorsed the fees that we're under today, um, that gave us the time to uh, continue to have those discussions. All right, um, I'm not going to make a motion. Someone else can. Before we make a motion, yeah. can we have Tina discuss what the budget policy actually says? I want to make sure that you guys are clear how these are going to automatically adjust going forward if you approve that. Thank you. So as we have in the past, staff will review fees every year um, to determine the 100% cost recovery goal. Um, some of those fees we would re recommend increment incremental increases annually so that there's no um, sticker shock, if you will. Um, and all fees will be at the cost of recovery goal by fiscal year 25. That said, if staff doesn't recommend charging 100% of the cost of service, you know, if John works with his folks and they decide that, no, we just want to go to 75%, then that fee amount would come back and be approved by city council to get your authorization for that um, divergence from the policy. Once fees do reach the 100% cost of service goal, uh, we would then, the finance department working with other departments would review those fees every other year to make sure that we are getting towards that cost recovery goal on an annual basis. Um, any new fees or the elimination of any fees require city council approval. All fee changes um, that are made would be implemented into the next year's budget cycle on October 1st. And um, any fees that are approved to go into effect on October 1st would be uh, with the approval of the city manager um, before those are implemented through the annual budget process. Any questions from council? I Billy? Just, I just want to be really, really clear, Teresa, that in May, when we as a council approve the fee schedule, which we did, that is what is in the um, policy right now. We've already approved that. That's in the policy. That is in, yes, ma'am, that's the in the fee ordinance. schedule that I mean, was included in, the code in, your, in your background. Yes, ma'am. Exactly. So whatever John and the Builders Association, you know, work out in the future, that would come back before us. But we would 
started to say something. So the policy governs that the fees will go to 100% cost recovery, recovery goal, again, incrementally. Um, if John comes back and, and uh, recommends that we don't go to 100% or he recommends the addition or elimination of any fees, then yes, that would definitely come back to the City Council for review and approval. Okay, thank you. Uh, may I make a motion that okay. we approve this item? Um, what is it, in? In, yes. Do I have a second? Second. And a second by Tommy. Um, do I have public <laughs> comment? Steve Hampton, uh, Southland Southwest area, district number six. Did I get it all? The uh, telephone number? Oh, okay. okay. Um, I think the government has pushed themselves into a, uh, a control situation here and uh, is now uh, raising the fees. We, it's, it's cutting down the time which people have to respond uh, to uh, increases and, uh, and we know that the, the public is slow to respond. So uh, I think that uh, whether it is one time or two times, it, 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 it doesn't matter. Uh, if you don't think it is right, Mayor, I don't. I wouldn't. Uh, I would suggest that we hold. Um, thank you. Thank you. Further public comment. Teresa, this is what we talked about right around the tornado time about when fees would come out. We could hold a meeting and make it simpler in this process for emergency purposes, right? right? This is making the fee review process one reading if necessary, if anything changes, or you just set a standard policy for how they increase, so we're not having to come back on two readings for all these fees every year. It's kind of what we have it set in forward motion already, right. it just simplifies it. Yes, but again, any changes, any major changes like John is proposing or he's working with the developers on, those there. still come back to you. If we add any new fees, those still come back to you. If we adjust something differently than what the policy recommends, that still comes back to you. Any further public comment or any further questions from council on the issue? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, motion passes 7-0. We will now move into the regular agenda. Comments regarding items on the regular agenda may be made by the public when each item is discussed as outlined above. Applicants, proponents, and appellants are expected are accepted from the time limit above and instead must limit their remarks to less than five minutes. We will start with A, a report from the Convention and Visitors Bureau and the Chamber of Commerce <coughs> Economic Development Council. And Diane, are you on first? I think so. Okay. Make sure I'm doing what I'm doing. I don't know which button I pushed. I'm Diane Bays. I'm the Vice President of the Convention and Visitors Bureau. Uh, thank you, Mayor, City Council, uh, uh, staff, and um, residents. I appreciate you giving me the time to talk about what our, our job is and what our efforts have been this past, uh, past year. Uh, first of all, our mission is to enhance the quality of life for the citizens of San Angelo through tourism marketing and promotion. And just to let everyone in the audience know about our funding, we are fully funded by the hotel sales tax that is paid for by the visitors, and that is a dedicated fund. So every expenditure must directly enhance and promote tourism and the convention and hotel industry, and every expenditure of the hotel occupancy tax must clearly fit into a one, one of nine statutorily provided categories for expenditures of local hotel occupancy tax revenues. And our goals this year, uh, to maintain hotel occupancy at a 60% or higher rate, to develop and implement wayfinding plan and signage, to market San Angelo to increase visitation and brand awareness, to expand our tourism base and educate the public on the economic impact of travel and tourism, and to encourage tourism product development and strategies to address future growth. Uh, these were goals that we set at the beginning of the year, so this is kind of where we are with our results. So as far as goal one, as far as our efforts for the 60% um, occupancy, what we have done, we have two sales uh, staff members, Susanna Aguirre and Amy Roberts, and we have, in, in this year to date, booked 
96 groups, meetings, and events this year. Some of those are held here. Some of those are held around um, other venues and hotels in our, our community. We've attended 26 consumer convention and leisure trade shows, and we have four more on the books that will continue throughout the rest of this year. We've provided over 4,800 welcome bags for year-to-date year for its 47 requests, and those are pr produced by our volunteers in our visitor center, so they take care of that for us. And then, of course, we do monthly sales calls. As far as gross hotel tax revenue comparison, in 2016 and 2017, we're around 1.9 million in hotel tax revenue. Uh, 2018, 2.5, and then 2019, we just got the September numbers and we were at 2.7 million. So we've seen a, a, a bit of a trajectory there and that does not include any new hotel products. So just letting you know that. As far as our results in occupancy and average daily rate, the occupancy right now is around 66%. And the state average is 60, so we are above that state average. 78% uh, on average daily rate, and that does include all 2,815 hotels and 33 prop or 33 properties in 2,815 rooms. As far as the development of implementing wayfinding and signage, this has turned into a, a much bigger product now. We have developed a visitor improvement program, which does include wayfinding and signage, but it also includes destination uh, development and management, conducting a community inventory, which we are in that process to, to determine all of the different products that are in our uh, that will be of, of interest to visitors. We're developing a multi-year plan on all of those things and we're identifying funding sources, which we're really happy that some um, have already been identified and we will be putting that plan in, in place, hopefully by next year. So this is not an, a, a quick process and we're looking at a three to five year plan. As far as our marketing is concerned, I wanted to share these numbers with you just where we put our marketing and what that distribution or readership is. So Texas State Travel Guide that is produced for the, uh, the Governor's Office of Travel and Tourism, that is a 700,000 total distribution. Texas Highways, 1.5 million readers and visits. True West Magazine, 915,000 reached annually. American Way, we did a one-time ad there and we had 23 million passengers in August in that advertisement um, opportunity. Authentic Texas, which is a quarterly publication, is 120,000 annually and that really focuses on the historic part of Texas and marketing there. The Texas Events Calendar is distributed at all of the travel information centers throughout uh, the state with, through TxDOT and that it produces 260,000 annually. Getting there. Uh, Ride Texas is a new publication that we started, and that is 18,000 uh, monthly distribution. See Texas First is a newspaper insert. People still read the newspaper. And that is 1.9 million in distribution. Shopacrosstexas.com is a website uh, focused entirely on shopping, and we have 2.1 million annual visits to that website. TourTexas.com is the second largest uh, website past travel, te right after travel, uh, Texas travel text uh, with 1.5 million users. The Texas Country Reporter Top Texas Town, that is a, a an, an, um, television show with uh, Bob Phillips and Kelly Phillips. It's been around for decades. And we have also produced two stories through uh, marketing with them, one focusing on the latest scoop, the other one on the Cactus Bookshop. Uh, we do a tour and meeting guide with 91,000 distribution to meeting planners across the state of Texas and then a Texas sports facility guide. Would you go back to that just a minute, Diane? Mm -hmm. You want to tell the story on um, the Cactus Bookstore in terms of what that um, uh, story produced for them? Sure. I actually, I talk to Felton pretty often. If you haven't been in the Cactus Bookshop, it's a one of a kind. Most people don't go don't even have those kinds of bookshops and so I, I actually talked to him yesterday and he has told me since that pub, that story aired which I think it was in February and it's re-aired on RFD television he has gotten either an email or a call every day from someone who saw that show and he, he even talked about his analytics and said he got on Google and saw his analytics. And they just, you know, they skyrocket every time they show that show. On Saturday, he said a couple drove in from Bay City, Texas, 
overnighted and were waiting at the door to get into the bookshop when he walked in on Saturday. So those kinds of um, stories really do make a big difference in those businesses. And, and, and in the Convention and Visitors Bureau world, we don't own anything. We have no skin in this game. We are just here to promote a product, and the people in this community have that product, and so that, that is how this works. <clears throat> we distributed 155,000 rack cards across Texas at travel information centers and hotels, restaurants, and other places with rack brochures. We conducted media missions in New York City, Atlanta, Anaheim, and Mexico provided assistance to TV shows shot here in San Angelo through our Film Friendly designation and created and distributed press kits to travelers and writers and bloggers across the, uh, across the country. We had stories featured in Texas Parks, Parks and Wildlife Magazine, American Way, True West, LonelyPlanet.com, who has, who has uh, talked about the Pop Art Museum now twice, once in August and once in October. Authentic Texas Magazine, SensiblySarah.com is a blogger, Rip Jeans and Bifocals is a blogger, and Texas Music Magazine. Uh, on our website, we manage DiscoverSanAngelo.com. We've had 175,000 page views year to date. We have 14,000 Facebook likes, Twitter, almost 1,000 followers, Instagram, almost 2,000. And I'll just mention in 2017, we had 275. So we've seen a huge increase there. Pinterest, we've continued to see uh, great efforts there. And I, I, we did do a marketing program with Texas Tourism this year. And they have a page for San Angelo, and they have over 19,000 followers on that page. And then, of course, YouTube. We have a number of videos there. Um, as far as uh, Goal Forward, which is expanding our tourism base, we created an award-winning National Travel and Tourism Week promotion for local officials to experience the city. And several of you participated in that. We presented at numerous local civic meetings on the economic impact of travel and tourism. And I know Councilman Thomas loves this stat. Uh, if not for visitor spending in San Angelo in 2018, every household will pay an additional $546. So tourism is important to our community. And we presented at statewide tourism workshops and conferences regarding San Angelo's tourism product. And then finally, um, to encourage uh, tourism product development, this is something that destination marketing organizations across the world are really focusing on, not only just marketing, but also management of the destination. And so we're looking at ways we can help um, in, in various ways. So one of, the, one of the opportunities we are developing is a stay-to-stay -stay promotion in 2020 to assist with talent acquisition. That sounds kind of an odd thing for a CVB to do, but we do have a number of businesses who need employees. And so I've, I saw this actual promotion done by a couple of different organizations across the country. And this is an opportunity to promote a weekend to come to San Angelo and then try to get those, those people with the job seekers that, or job businesses that are looking for jobs. And so we are, we're looking at developing that, potentially a quarterly opportunity where we focus on um, manufacturing, we focus on um, medical, education, wherever we need to focus on the people looking for the jobs. And then we can do some targeted media that gets them to overnight, so it still gets our goal, but it also gives them an opportunity to seek that talent acquisition. Uh, we are scheduling a course in crisis management and communication in 2020 with our um, attractions and hotel partners based on the issues that happened in El Paso and Dayton and um, it just left me, um, uh, Odessa. And so those, uh, those challenges ha are real, and so we want to make sure when the 1,800 to 2,500 people per day are staying in our hotels that we are addressing that crisis communication challenge, and we've met with the city manager and um, the emergency management team at this, of the city. And then finally, our visitor improvement program. We've kind of touched on it a little bit, um, but we're working with economic development, MPO, and community partners on need assessments. And then uh, we will have some upcoming surveys uh, that we're working with MPO with um, on that. And then upcoming events and activities, Don't Mess With Texas Permanent Mural, mural Contest. 
Bay City, Houston, and San Angelo are the three permanent locations that Don't Mess With Texas selected for their permanent mural contest. We are seeking our top 10 Western town designation for 2020 with True West Magazine. We were number two this year. We're seeking to knock Tombstone out, uh, who was in number one place, so we think we can do that. Uh, we will be introducing the San Angelo Revolution Film Festival in April of 2020. We have the Cowboy Way Jubilee, April 30th through May 3rd. This is a $250,000 econo economic impact event that we were able to uh, take, uh, honestly, from Ardmore, Oklahoma. Sorry, Ardmore. And uh, they are, are actually even adding a three-day add-on prior to the event starting because their planner has been here three times now. She's coming, actually, she's coming back a third time to, I don't know what's going on with the lights, it's kind of fun. Um, <laughs> is, that, is that like get off the stage? <laughs> and then uh, we are also seeking a multi-day music festival for 2021. And just to give you a little bit about the awards and recognitions we have received this year, 2019 at the, the Texas Association of Convention and Visitors Bureau's annual conference, we were, uh, we were received first place for a National Tour Travel and Tourism Week promotion and second place for local awareness campaign. I've talked about our True West uh, Top 10 Western Town designation. We also re received our Music Friendly designation of the Texas Music Office and our Visitor Center in San Angelo State Park were named Best of the Best by the American Bus Association. That is it. Well, that certainly makes us proud of San Angelo, doesn't it? It is. Go Cowboys, even if it's not the football team. Yes. <laughs> Harry. <laughs> Very quickly, Diane, would you review the people that are on your visitor improvement program to see the breadth of that particular Well, and, and that's continuing to grow. Uh, we have uh, Councilman Thomas and Count Councilman Thompson. Uh, Councilman Thompson, because of the rodeo uh, piece that we felt that was very important. Uh, we have Howard Taylor with the Museum of Fine Arts, Bob Blueheart with uh, Fort Concho, um, 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 golly, Major Hoffines with MPO, and uh, we've added Guy Andrews, and we will be adding, with uh, economic development, we are going to be reaching out to ASU about this and also the school district because we really feel like they are important. As far as the board, we have downtown development with, uh, uh, or downtown with Adele Velasquez, and I have three board members on, on the board, Penny Larson, and um, all of a sudden I'm, I'm blank, Scott Zaruba, who is one of our hoteliers. And uh, so it's a, it's a very diverse board, and we will continue to involve uh, others as needed. Great job. Thanks. Do I have other questions or comments from anyone on council? I'll yes, just Tom? kick this in. It's been wonderful the past two or three years, Diane, to see the passion you've put into making this go. I know at the rodeo, we're working on things to help provide you better information to help the projects that you list here even benefit San Angelo more. So I just want to say nice job. Job well done. Thank you. Michael, you're on. Hey, uh, good morning, everybody. We're, we will uh, work on the mood lighting uh, segment of our presentation. I'm Michael Looney. I'm the VP of Economic Development for the San Angelo Chamber of Commerce. And that is a tough act to follow, isn't it? It is. Boy, gosh, wow. Um, kind of skip through the basics. I know we've got a, a thick schedule here today, but uh, uh, the Economic Development Department of the Chamber of Commerce, oh, there we go. We partner with and are contracted by the City of San Angelo Development Corporation, which is a division of the City of San Angelo, and Tom Green County to conduct marketing activities with the goal of recruiting employers, attracting new jobs, and increasing capital investment to the San Angelo area. And we've had a very successful quarter. I'm gonna go through some of the transactions that we've been focusing on, and these are transactions that have closed or are very close to closing. Uh, and this is only activity that's in this quarter. SMC Global Corporation is a company that we've been working with for about two years, and we've heard a lot about them, and I report a lot, on, a lot about them. Uh, each quarter, and it's because they continue to grow, which is the greatest kind of recruit job we can do. Uh, this is a company based out of New York City. They're an international chemicals manufacturer. Uh, they have opened their second expansion in San Angelo, and this was the old R.G. Berry building, which was 100,000 square feet. So they are now a 140,000 square foot tenant um, in San Angelo. 
They've created 11 new jobs, a capital investment amount of $3.3 million, uh, and they produce a $5.7 million economic impact. And these are annualized numbers. When you look at it, uh, this is a company that came to us. Uh, we recruited them, and we, we were looking for just one small facility. And over time, we've built relationship with them, and, and they've seen the, the, the strength of, this, of the Southwest US market. And they've decided to call San Angelo home, which was, a, we think, a really, really good decision. Uh, they are currently growing, uh, and they're going to grow even further, as they just told us last week. So these are the kinds of relationships that we, we love to report on and, and that uh, uh, to Harry's point, to Councilman Thomas's point, uh, our, our objective is not just to create jobs, but it's to see vacant properties that are put into use. And that is both raw land and vacant uh, buildings. And we were really proud of this transaction because this company took down three, they leased three large uh, manufacturing facilities that had been vacant for years. And they put a lot of money, of their own money, into these properties. Allen's Transport, this is a company out of uh, Alberta, Canada. This is, a, this is gonna yield off a $2.7 million economic output in year one, a $1.3 million estimated capital investment, creating 10 jobs at about $60,000 each with benefits. They're also gonna be constructing a 25,000 square foot terminal. This is a chemical transportation company building on 12 acres that they've purchased in the industrial park. Another uh, very large scale economic development transaction that we've been working on for about three years, which has begun construction, which is out on 2288. This is not in the city limits, but it's, it's very close to it. Uh, this is Recurrent Energy. This is a division of a company called Canadian Solar. We've been working with them for about three years. Uh, this is a project that's called Project Rambler. And if you're driving on 2288, you'll see a sign that says RE Rambler. This is a 200 megawatt, 3,800 acre solar power generation plant. This is one of the first of its kind in Texas in that it uses bifacial solar panels that pick up power from not just the sun, but also reflecting off the ground. Um, and our Chamber of Commerce worked directly with the county and with the uh, Water Valley Independent School District on conducting the 312 and the 313 agreements that made this transaction possible. This is a $180 million capital investment. This is a massive capital investment for the San Angelo area. And this is gonna pr produce not only secondary economic yields to our community, but it also provides a very strong tax yield. Imagine, you know, the levy on a $180 million project is very high, but it also produces a yield to the independent school district. In this case, it's Water Valley. And this is one, of, one project of five solar power generation plants that we're currently working with right now. And then uh, in the housing uh, field, this is something that's very important to us because without housing, it's very difficult to recruit companies. It's very difficult to expand existing companies. This is a project called Creek 27. This is a multifamily development that uh, has gotten a little bit of uh, play in the press recently. It's about a $25 million capital investment in the city limits. And this is actually a very unique, uh, kind of a, what they call a Seattle, Washington style cottage community. It's gonna be 250 units. Uh, groundbreaking was presumed that it would be sometime in October. That's gonna be pushed out more probably towards the very end of the year. And more information will be forthcoming on the design and, and all the engineering that is right now with the city. Uh, but what's really important about this is this is a very unique project. It's not a multi-story, multi-family development, and it's not a, it's not a single-family housing development as well. Uh, this is actually a unique design. There are very few of these in Texas. Uh, they are only for rent, but they're priced uh, in that range. They're market rate, too. There's no, there's no subsidization. This is not a government program. This isn't public housing. These are market rates, but they're built almost like what they call micro homes, so they're very compact. Um, and because of their square footage size uh, that most of the tenants that have been polled in this region would desire, that's the millennial generation. These are the students at ASU, these are students um, at uh, Goodfellow Air Force Base and young professionals that don't want a 2,500 or 3,000 square foot single family home. They want something that's compact, but they want something where they have green space around them. And this is what this project is gonna provide. 
And so this is going to be really, really helpful with corporate recruitment as well. And that's one of the challenges that we've bumped into when talking to companies that we've been wanting to recruit with larger groups of employees is that we're really tight on housing. So this is going to help out greatly. If you go back and look at um, the total uh, pr uh, value of the projects that we've put to bed and that we've groomed to complete closure this quarter, um, that is a, a, uh, it's a, it's a fairly substantial amount. That's a uh, $249 million uh, total value. Uh, and that is obviously basically buoyed in large part by a $180 million solar power generation plant. Um, but we're Repeat very pleased to those numbers again. Uh, yeah, hold on a second. Let me find that real quick. Uh, Mayor, I don't have that total number here, uh, but I do have it with me, and I can certainly report that. No, but it's, you just oh, said a number, so just it's, repeat it's, what it's you just said. It's over that, that two, two, uh, I believe I said that was a 200 and... 49 I'm million. sorry, two, two, 209, $209 million total. Thank you, 209 a uh, million dollar total, and that is comprised of four projects. Okay. And uh, I know we've got a big schedule today. I see a lot of people it. behind We're us, listening. but uh, uh, that is, uh, is going to sum summarize the uh, economic projects that we've worked on this quarter that have closed. And then finally, I would like to talk about the Railport San Angelo project. This is a 183-acre site. Uh, that is bordered by 2105 and 50th Street. And this is a project uh, that we are very, very interested in seeing come to complete flourishing because this is going to interlock, uh, finally, that uh, the Texas Pacifico rail line that comes through San Angelo down to the Port of Presidio onto the Port of Tapa Lobampo. Uh, this rail port will play a critical role in enhancing the economy for decades to come. Uh, we are considering it's going to uh, have 112 estimated cars per month, uh, and it will have um, uh, approximately 16,000 uh, feet, linear feet of track built uh, within the boundaries. And it is scalable, so it is expandable. Talk about the community of, as you've had conversations with potential users. Talk about some of those comments. We, we have, yes, thank you. We have been uh, right now in the stage of feasibility where we're working with different companies to discuss what kind of commodities and what kind of um, uh, finished products they would be creating in San Angelo, developing and then sending off down uh, either to Mexico or out to um, Coleman Junction, which would then take them up the BNSF line up to Chicago and then out through the eastern seaboard of the United States. Uh, we've been working with agricultural companies, steel companies, a uh, lot of chemical companies, as we've seen by some of the other companies that have come into San Angelo. Um, and so we think that ag, uh, steel, uh, finished products, plastics, uh, and fertilizers and grains will be some of the major commodities that are going to be exported from San Angelo. Of course, there's going to be uh, some products that are going to be imported for uh, ultimate transloading the truck out to the Permian Basin and vice versa. And rail Talk port about like the this, agricultural community and their response. The, the ag yes, the ag uh, agricultural community has uh, probably been the most vocal supporter of this project in that for so many years they've never had a product like this to haul the bulk amounts of grain, uh, fertilizers, and chemicals that they use uh, to San Angelo, but then also to get their grains and cotton out to market. And so I, I can't name the names of the companies, but uh, we've met with several of them, uh, many of them, that are very, very interested in seeing this uh, rail port uh, completed for construction. And two that we've met with already have, it was really pretty awesome when we met with them. It was kind of a, kind of a pr pregnant pause, a showstopper, and they said, this really changes everything. This changes our dialogue with our corporate headquarters on what the San Angelo Concho Valley department of our company is going to do going forward. And so we're right now working with Shea Transportation. This is a company that is uh, owned by uh, Roger Horton who is a, a former BNSF rail employee. Uh, and um, we're working together on approaching these companies so that we can understand better what the needs are and come up with a final permanent design for this uh, rail port. Yes, do I have questions Any for other questions? Michael? 
I just want to say, Michael, that um, the business of economic development is all about relationship building, that many of these companies have many areas or several choices to make. Your ability to work with them, um, the time and effort you've put into them has created a great success, and I don't think we would have had these successes if you hadn't worked as hard and developed the great relationships you have with these companies. So thank you for your work, your effort, and the impact on our economy. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate very much uh, the opportunity to come and present, and see you next quarter. Thank you. I say thank you also, Mr. Looney. Okay, what we're, we're going to do B, and after B, we're going to move up item E. Um, item E, Billy, is that it? E? E. Okay, yes, so please. we're going to do B and then E. So go ahead, we'll do B, public hearing on proposed development and consideration of approving a resolution of general support for low-income housing tax credit, LIHTC project, in SMD2 by SA Villas at Shriners Point, LP, to construct affordable housing apartments in San Angelo on 37th Street and 40th Street. And Bob, you're on. Uh, good morning, Council. Um, this morning we have Mr. Granger McDonald uh, with McDonald's Company to uh, present a proposal for a tax credit project on the north side of town. Uh, normally, we come to you in January with the standard 9% program, uh, but Granger's actually applying for a 4% uh, program, which is less competitive and is a different timeline. Uh, we are asking council to support a resolution of support for this, uh, for this program, and without further ado, I'll give you Granger. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, uh, Madam Mayor, and council members. It's a pleasure to be here in front of you. My name is Granger McDonald, I'm chairman of the McDonald Companies. Uh, our home base is in Kerrville, but arguably uh, it could be here in San Angelo with the amount of development we have here and ongoing projects. We built our first project in San Angelo in 1997. Our company is a family-owned company specializing in development of building and managing multifamily neighborhoods across Texas. Our focus is rural, small metro areas that allow us to provide affordable housing for communities in need. Because we own and operate our own apartment communities, we build them uh, with sustainability and quality and comfort in mind. Uh, Justin McDonald, my son, uh, is an ASU graduate. We've been around here a long time, and so San Angelo has a special place in our heart. We've developed a bent tree apartments, River Place. We worked in conjunction with the North Angelo NOAA estates on 36 single family houses, and we also own and operate the Vistas at Red Creek. Shriners Point's 156 units. Uh, it'll be workforce housing, as Bob said. Uh, we'll have a, a mix of one, two, and three bedroom units. Uh, typically, we do 30% uh, one bedroom, 40% two bedroom, and 30% three bedroom. Uh, we have an increasing population, as you just heard from the Economic Improvement Corporation folks. Uh, they need more housing here, you need more workforce housing here, and you need it to be affordable. I think most of you know where our location is on the north side. Kind of zero in, you can see we're close to Lakeview High School. That's how we fit on the site with the neighborhood. And as you scan in, you'll see our, our site plan shows a tremendous amount of green space and open area. Uh, you know, we, we cater to families. We're not, we're not corporate housing. We want families that live here. That means families have to have places for kids to play. Some place we have a dog park to take care of, you know, our, our four-legged friends. Uh, this is the type of community we want, and I think that San Angelo needs. It's an elevation of our clubhouse facility. It has an indoor uh, workout facility, its own private gym, uh, swimming pool, et cetera. We also have a computer center in our, in our clubhouses, and it's amazing the amount of use they get from kids that come in and line up to do the homework every day. This is the elevations of, of our buildings. Our unit floor plans, as you can see, our units are, are, are quite large. They're, they're very open floor plans. Lots of light, lots of windows. We 
They'll range in size from, uh, they'll average about 1,100 square feet with, on each unit. And that's the rest of the building plans. I know that what you're presenting today, there's a big need in San Angelo for this project um, with apartments, 96% full. One of the biggest opportunities for us is to find a, affordable housing. If we're going to continue to grow this city, this economy, housing is going to be a key factor. So I'm thrilled and I strongly support, Granger, what you're presenting today. Thank you. Any other questions? No other questions or comments? Um, what kind of a motion do we need on this that we just, what do you need? Uh, we need approval of a resolution. I make a motion to uh, create a resolution of support for um, this Shriners Point project by the McDonald Company. Second. Any public comment? No public comment. We'll ask that the council take a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you. Get started on it. <laughs> we need it now. We'll move to item E, first reading and public hearing of an ordinance approving a rezoning from the general commercial heavy commercial CGCH zoning district to the planned development PD19-08 zoning district to allow for an indoor entertainment facility with accessory alcohol beverage sales on for on premise consumption, outdoor recreation and entertainment and a mobile food units being 1.0720 acres located at 4382 Southwest Boulevard. John, you're on. Thank you. <coughs> As you mentioned, this is a rezoning from CGCH to a planned development district. Uh, you can see the location there right there at the corner of Green Meadow and Southwest Drive, or Southwest Boulevard actually. It's about one acres. Um, and we may come back to this in a minute. Um, you can see the area is uh, in the long range plan for commercial, so commercial activity is considered appropriate for the area. It is already zoned general commercial, heavy commercial. Uh, this rezoning to a planned development uh, is basically to allow uh, for the alcohol use, uh, the entertainment use that is uh, not allowed without either the planned development or something like a conditional use. Uh, although I should point out that uh, something like a restaurant that could have many of the same features of this proposed use uh, would already be allowed today. Uh, it's the addition of the alcohol sales uh, is primarily the difference. Uh, if the restaurant was going to be there, they could have alcohol sales. Uh, that's correct. That's so right. Explain that again. Well, there's different, um, uh, different permitting for uh, alcohol permits. If it's with a restaurant, that's a different type of TABC <laughs> permit. Uh, versus a bar, uh, and the primary difference is a restaurant serves food and alcohol is a kind of a side item uh, versus a bar where the alcohol service is the primary uh, purpose of it. Uh, Mayor. Yes, Billy. Um, John, I want to be sure I'm clear. So as the zoning stands today, the C CGCH zoning, this particular business could go in there right now as the zoning, just minus the alcohol. Right, minus being a bar with in nothing else. Right. The outdoor entertainment, so the fact that they're having, uh, if you can see on this map, uh, this outdoor open space within that fenced area, um, that outdoor entertainment type use is also what requires this uh, special approval. So uh, they could have a restaurant today, they could serve alcohol today, um, but they couldn't be, they couldn't get a permit for a bar uh, or the outdoor store, I'm sorry, outdoor recreation uh, without this approval. Okay, but the family entertainment portion of it, uh, because I did have an opportunity to meet with Miss Anita and Mr. Benson, and they were showing me around, and they were talking about um, inside seating, a game arcade, so those things could still go in there indoor items. the indoor yes. items could right. still go in there all right thank you uh, but again as you'll see as as you note from the um, number of responses we got from the surrounding properties um, the 
as you can imagine, a bar use might have different characteristics from a restaurant use. And outdoor entertainment presents some issues related to noise and other things that um, that if it was all indoors wouldn't be an issue. And so uh, that's part of what uh, part of why it requires this special approval is because of those uh, additional uh, potential impacts to the surrounding properties. So also, um, John, the park in there is very limited. Now I understand, according to whatever our ordinance is, that they meet the park the number of park and slot requirements but if you have a, a business of this sort um, and you have employees that would need to park in some of the spots what happens with that overflow parking are they going to be able to park on the street or or what well first let me say that based on some preliminary concept plans that, that is in your packet um, we haven't completely verified that they will meet parking because it depends on some things on how they use uh, building space, how much outdoor recreation activity is happening outside. So I don't want to say that they for sure meet the parking uh, with the current parking, but as you'll see, uh, they have actually proposed some additional parking to help address that concern, uh, and they be, may be able to speak more to that. But yes, if a, if a use like this is short of parking, but it meets our standards, um, it could result in overflow parking either on the street, although there's, I guess there's a limited space there for some parking on the street, but it very likely could spill over into adjacent properties. Um, what we often encourage property owners in those situations to do is develop agreements with those surrounding property owners uh, because there's no, uh, you know, uh, tenants or, or customers of this business have no right to park on that next door property. And so we have similar situations around town, not many because we think our parking standards are, are pretty good for most uses, uh, but we have a few cases where uh, parking will spill over onto adjacent property and sometimes those adjacent properties resort to towing vehicles and, and other things to address that concern. But, um, you know, you mentioned the letters, the number of letters I've received, almost 40 emails, um, some that are in the packet and some that I think I was handed this morning, but that is one of the primary concerns of the neighbors in the area. And there would just well, let me just ask this question. Maybe you have an answer and maybe you don't. How could that be controlled to keep people from parking on adjacent neighbors' property? Again, largely, and let, well, one way is for you to s uh, stipulate some parking requirements that may be above and beyond our normal parking to, to say that they can only have this business if they provide X number of parking spaces, or you could place limits on the uh, size of buildings or outdoor uh, entertainment areas, but largely it falls to those adjacent properties to either place signs that say you can't park here, uh, enforcement through towing off of their property, uh, but there's, uh, other than some of the limited things you can do through this PD, um, that really falls to those private property owners to enforce their private property uh, and, and allow no parking if that's their choice. Just a few pictures of the area, we can come back to these, but the, uh, in this picture, the proposed business is off to the left. Uh, you can see some apartments immediately across the street, uh, and then a picture looking west. And this is from the parking lot of the proposed business. You can see, again, the apartments, um, and then across southwest. Uh, that's just, you can see the existing parking lot. Uh, again, as we may talk about, back behind this fence, they've proposed expanding the parking lot into that area to address some of the parking concerns. Before I go off of that, you can see here uh, the immediately adjacent business is a, a veterinary clinic, um, and they are one of the uh, opponents uh, who've written in an opposition, and they're, one of their big concerns was uh, the parking, that spillover parking might come into their lot. Uh, their secondary concern was uh, they do uh, animal boarding there as well, and so they were uh, afraid that uh, outdoor activity on that adjacent lot might uh, upset the animals and create barking that might also interfere with the business use on this property. Uh, and so I think they felt that, that those were not necessarily compatible adjacent uses from their perspective. 
this is looking down Southwest Boulevard, so this is the side of the, the subject property. You can see they do have a fence there. Uh, this is the east side fence adjacent to that veterinary clinic, uh, although the applicant is proposing and we're proposing in the plan development to have a fence, a solid fence along that side uh, to provide more screening. And this is just looking through that chain link, existing chain link fence into that back uh, uh, area, which would become that outdoor entertainment area. This is the original concept plan as they proposed it. Um, you can see the 15 parking spaces there in blue. Um, they've proposed a food truck area so that they would bring in, invite food trucks in uh, to provide some of the food service for their guests and customers. And you can see here is their revised plan. Uh, they've created this driveway through here uh, with some additional parking uh, to provide a total of 26 parking spaces instead of just the uh, current 15 spaces, uh, hopefully to address some of that concern with spillover parking. Uh, staff is recommending approval, as did the Planning Commission. Um, some of the reasons that are outlined in your staff report. Uh, again, it is a uh, commercial area. We believe with some of the screening and uh, meeting the parking requirements uh, that they do, uh, they are compatible with the area. Um, we've proposed uh, fencing standards as well as closing hours. They could only uh, stay open until 1030 on Sunday through Wednesday or midnight on Thursday. Uh, I will say that in earlier discussions, uh, we had recommended that those times be a slightly earlier, uh, like 11 o'clock on uh, Sunday, or I'm sorry, Thursday in the weekend. Um, the Planning Commission was concerned that with this particular business, um, that that may or may not be sufficient for them. And so the Planning Commission's recommendation to you was to extend those hours a little bit, so the midnight and the 1030 on weekdays. Did the Planning Commission, John, have access to the letters that are in the background packet and the ones that we were given this morning? Uh, there were a few, but I would say the vast majority of those have come in uh, since the Planning Commission, so between the Planning Commission and now. So they did not have the benefit of all of the opposition that you all have uh, before you. We did send out our notices to the surrounding property owners. Uh, we received five in favor, including one within the 200-foot uh, area. We received 20 in opposition, and now that's actually uh, 12 additional uh, in addition to that 20, uh, two of them within the 200-foot radius. Uh, this says 16 from the church, uh, but there were seven additional from the church since we created this slide. So they've continued to come in, as, as you probably know. Uh, over the last few days. And so, um, again, so pretty significant opposition from the surrounding properties, uh, although I will note that most of those are from the church, which is the one property. Uh, in terms of the number of properties surrounding it, uh, it's only the two properties, the church and the vet clinic. And so that does not reach the 20% that would trigger a supermajority. Uh, so a, a simple majority vote today would suffice. So, John... Um, is the apartment complex across the street within the 200-foot radius? Uh, yes, that's, that's that property right there. And, and we didn't hear from any of the tenants in the apartment complex? Well, we didn't hear from... I don't you believe mail it we, to the tenants I, I or do you we mail did. it? Yeah, yeah it goes the to the property owner, and we did not hear any support or opposition from the property owner. Uh, but as the mayor mentioned, we do not... Uh, notify tenants of apartment complexes. We notify the property owners, uh, and that's what's required by state law to notify the property owner, not, not tenants. We did put um, the sign up that said rezoning yes. and application being made or whatever that sign says. That's right. Okay. Review you. again the um, issue of hours. Talk about the hours and then also talk about noise level because we have a noise ordinance in place, and the issue is how controllable is that noise ordinance in terms of decimals, how we, how we oversee that, is it by complaint only, is it by, how do we do that? Well, first on the hours, they would not open before 11 a.m., and then on weekdays they would close by 10.30, and on weekends they would close by midnight. 
Uh, and so that's the proposed hours of operation per the plan development. Again, that's up to you all. That's that's one of the conditions that you can place on it. So if the hours of operation are a concern, uh, you can adjust those as you see necessary. Uh, regarding noise, there's currently nothing special written into the plan development district regarding noise. Uh, but So that would fall to just the city's general noise requirements, uh, which is kind of a general um, reasonable person standard. It's not, as some cities have, a decibel limit where you take a, a meter out and and uh, gauge the noise level. And if it's over a certain threshold, it's it's in violation. If it's below it, it's not. Um, so our, our ordinance, as I understand it, is more of a uh, just, is it too noisy? Which, as you mentioned, can be a problem is, you know, how much noise is too noisy? Um, and so that could be a concern if, if noise is a problem or a concern. Uh, is how we would enforce that uh, if it becomes too loud. Is there a stage plan for out in the outdoor area? I would defer that to the uh, to the applicant to talk about what all they're proposing in that outdoor recreation area. As far as we're concerned, uh, under our ordinances, outdoor recreation is outdoor recreation. Uh, but again, with the plan development, you can limit that. So if you if you want to allow certain types of outdoor recreation but not others, you can further limit that. But that's not in the currently drafted plan development. But if someone if someone wanted to turn that into a restaurant today, that restaurant could build there without objections because it's zoned currently that way and they could serve alcohol, beer, and wine. They could. Now, they, they might be limited in terms of outdoor, the outdoor entertainment. And so uh, one thing that we have done in other plan developments um, is limit noise, not through a specific noise limit, but by limiting what can go on outside. Uh, the example, example, yeah. example I can think of isn't really with a restaurant, but uh, a car dealership, for example, that's next to some homes, oftentimes they'll have a big speaker and they say, you know, salesman Bob, please come to the front, and that those loudspeakers can be uh, annoying to neighbors. And so in some cases where these are uh, commercial uses or adjacent to homes or apartments, will limit <laughs> outdoor speakers so that um, any kind of noise, whether it be uh, just speaking over a microphone or even amplified music and that sort of thing would not be allowed. Now, again, that's my guess is that's probably part of their design here is to have some music playing outside and those sorts of things. So that's a balance of, of the neighbor's concerns versus uh, helping make a business work. Um, but that's something, again, that you could place some conditions on uh, if you wanted to limit the amount of outdoor uh, noise through limiting the types of activity they could do outside. Um, I, really all I have left, I think, is just the staff is recommending approval with all of those conditions. Uh, the Planning Commission did recommend approval by a 5-0 vote. Uh, again, I'll just repeat, they did not have the benefit of much of the opposition that, that you all have heard uh, to date. Um, here's a summary of those list of conditions. Um, compliance with the underlying zoning, uh, have to bring in a site plan that's consistent with the concept plan that you've seen, uh, out limiting uh, outdoor storage. Um, they have to revise their concept plan to show us a little more detail before it gets approved with things like what's in their amenity area, uh, landscape plan, sidewalk plan. Uh, we would require their exterior lighting be shielded so they're not uh, if they have outdoor lighting, it's not lighting up on adjacent properties. And then we've talked about the hours of uh, operation as well as the, uh, well, there is a, another issue. There's a north fence that had been constructed in the past that was constructed into the floodplain or the floodway, actually, um, that never received a final permit. Uh, we would require that they finally permit that and uh, address any concerns with floodway development permits. And I think this is just the actual wording of the conditions of approval in case there are questions. Uh, but with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Harry, you have a question? I just, I just want to know, how long has this particular building been empty? That's a good question. It's been a couple of years, I believe. Approximately two years. Two years. 
Yeah, the applicant can speak to that, I think, better than, than I could. But. I think it's another one of those op opportunities to get somebody in with a viable business and put this back on the tax rolls uh, and possibly even have some additional uh, property tax if they're expanding. So, you know, there are some things we probably can do to, to address some of the uh, church's concerns, some of the citizens' concerns, but I think overall we really need to get somebody back in this building. Tom? John, what's this going to do to the property value of the veterinary clinic beside it? That's always a hard question to answer. Um, my guess is that it wouldn't affect it. Gen generally, property values are driven by larger scale things, and uh, oftentimes you'll hear people stand up here and say, this is going to affect my property values. We don't see that much of an effect of an adjacent business. Uh, on the property values, uh, especially in a commercial area like this, but I hate to say that there wouldn't be any impact. Do I have further questions from council? Uh, comment, comments? Mayor. Go ahead, Tommy. Um, John, did the Planning Commission have any conversation about, uh, I'm going to say traffic concerns, or let's call them maybe more safety concerns, that intersection of Green Meadow and Southwest Boulevard is a bear to get across um, Southwest Boulevard. Um, I have concerns about that. Did the Planning Commission have any conversation about that? They really didn't. I think, I guess my only comment on that would be uh, this is an area planned for commercial activity. Um, something commercial ideally ideally we don't want it, want it to remain vacant so something commercial whether it's this use a restaurant uh, something else is going to generate some traffic uh, and that intersection uh, the characteristics of it aren't really going to change uh, so i think yes that's a concern and to the extent that this maybe drives more traffic than another use uh, that's that's a valid concern uh, but again that most of the traffic that goes through that intersection is already there, and while this will add some, uh, it won't it won't double traffic at that intersection. I wouldn't think. Uh, you know, the two previous businesses there, <clears throat> in my memory, one was um, construction related, and they just really that was just an office for them and then the other one was a, a business that did their business out in the community and people didn't really go there so this this will generate more traffic no doubt um, I, I think that's something that, that we at least need to be aware of we have traffic counts relative to daytime versus evening because obviously during the daytime there's a lot of traffic going through that intersection but what happens after the hour of seven o'clock I do not have that. I don't know if there's, if uh, I suspect no one is here that is prepared to answer that. We probably do have some traffic count data um, in public works engineering uh, or the MPO, but uh, we did not prepare any of that for today. You know, yes, Mayor, Billy? I just, I have some comments. Um, you know, I met with the applicants for this zone change, and I also met with uh, people that are the neighbors immediately to the east. And um, the applicants, you know, assured me, and I think they were very sincere in wanting to be a good neighbor and what can we, what adjustments, what can we consider doing that would make this worse? I mean, make it work, not make it worse, make it work. <laughs> Excuse me, slip of the tongue. <laughs> but as we um, consider all of the concerns of the neighbors to the east that we've gotten, Dr. Blanton's concern, um, you know, was he boards dogs overnight. And so with the outside game area, with the music, it would probably be disruptive, you know, to his business. Um, the same concern with the church not just the parking, but the noise, and um, with the vehicle traffic on Loop 306 right there, that the noise would have to be, the volume of the music would have to be increased, and then that, in fact, would be disruptive to the church services. And um, as Tommy mentioned, also the congestion at, at that intersection is immense. 
And I have traveled that morning, noon, and night for different reasons. And um, it has quite a bit. I have no idea, Mayor, what the traffic count is, but certainly um, that area is really congested. So, you know, I understand Harry's point about getting vacant buildings filled and, um, and back on the tax rolls, but I think we have to be prudent in consideration for what businesses go in what location. And as I have taken a look at it and walked around the property and talked to people, and certainly all of the um, feedback we've gotten in opposition, I just don't think that this is the best fit for this business at this location. I think San Angelo could very well use additional family entertainment types of venues, but I think it needs to be in the right location. We approved one not too long ago on College Hills Boulevard where the putt-putt golf course. They have area all around, so I think that's an ideal location for family entertainment types of businesses. So um, with all of my comments and, and listening to the concerns, I am going to make a motion that we deny this plan development um, rezoning and leave it at the CHCG because they can still have their business. They just couldn't have the outdoor entertainment and they couldn't have the alcohol. So that is my motion, Mayor. There's a motion. Is there a second? I'll second that, Mayor. Uh, Tommy has a second. Um, public comment, please. <clears throat> Councilman, <clears throat> excuse me, Council Lynn. This is my first uh, address to a city council meeting. I appreciate your patience with me. My name is Boyd Jennings. I live at 3326 Southland Boulevard uh, in the area in which uh, <clears throat> that is under consideration, just two blocks from the proposed um, uh, property that we're, we're discussing this morning. I, I've been a, um, a, an evangelist with the Green Meadow Church of Christ for 16 years. And we're just uh, two properties over from uh, the property we're considering this morning. And really our concerns, and I'm speaking for myself, but I think also I'm speaking for the congregation as well, that we really have two general concerns. We have a, a, a short-term concern and a long-term concern as well. Uh, our short-term concerns are the safety factors, as you have adequately discussed this morning, already <clears throat> that it is an extremely busy intersection uh, many of us in the church avoid that intersection and i try to get our, our our older people to avoid it and go around and and maybe go up to south and boulevard and take the light so we understand the the issue there with uh, vehicle traffic and so that is a concern it seems to me that for some reason as the traffic is accelerating up the hill there over the speed limit when they're coming down that little hill there on, on uh, southwest. They're exceeding the speed limit, so that makes it you know, increasingly difficult to cross there. Uh, and of course, when there's pedestrian traffic on top of that, then you've got uh, a, a, a really serious, uh, potentially hazardous situation. Uh, I think all of the, our concerns were addressed by uh, Ms. DeWitt, and I appreciate her very much for saying that. Um, we are concerned about the spillover tra uh, parking into our property and, and any possible damage that may occur if the if, um, uh, situation uh, came to that level. Uh, the, one of our chief concerns, I think, is the mixing of recreation uh, for children with the adult consumption of alcohol. And while I realize that goes on all over town, uh, when you combine that, that factor with heavy traffic at a difficult intersection, there's, a, I think, a high probability of injury. We've got 30 seconds, okay. Uh, along with that is our concern for any child who may uh, be allowed to cross the street <clears throat> uh, from the various apartments nearby. And we're concerned about maybe children being there unattended 
with the consumption of alcohol. There's the noise factor that's been addressed, <clears throat> but that's very hard to control when you have outdoor entertainment. Uh, and then there's the long-term concern that is if this property goes to someone else, then what kind of business then will be there uh, selling, potentially selling alcohol. So uh, those are our concerns and I stated them uh, maybe as quickly as I could. I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much. More public comment? Thank you, Mayor and Council. My name is Gerald Turn. I'm a member of Single, Mister, uh, single Member District 3, Harry. Uh, at any rate, I too go to Green Meadow Church of Christ, but I drive there. One of the things that I wanted to point out and bring to your attention is that the apartment complexes there at that intersection are numerous. We have all kinds of foot traffic and especially young children that go with their parents and they walk from those apartments all the way to the mall, to <coughs> McDonald's. And that's going to was one thing that stuck in my mind and does each time I go to church uh, during the week over there. So please take that into consideration. Again, the parking and all of the things that uh, Brother Jennings uh, said to you, uh, please take those into consideration. One other thing that we need to look at, the street, the underground water flow in that area. There have been potholes, and I mean big potholes, for months, not because no one wanted to fix them, but because that particular area has an underground water flow down to that creek. The increased traffic there is going to increase that problem as well. So I hope you'll take that into consideration as you uh, weigh this issue. With that, uh, I believe Brother Jennings covered the rest of it. I would urge you not to change the zoning of this uh, facility. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please come forward. Mayor, members of the council, my name is Stephen Kozad. I am one of the three elders of the uh, church that meets at, uh, there, uh, the Church of Christ that meets at Green Meadow Boulevard. Um, I thank you for this time. Uh, this, this is a first for me also to address the, the council, uh, but I thank you for your time to uh, address my concerns on this issue. Uh, it's an established principle and, and our belief through the, the Holy Scriptures that there's no authority except from God and that uh, in those which exist are established by God. And that's Romans, the 13th chapter. And with this in mind, I, I recognize the res awesome responsibility that you all are given. And uh, you have my total respect and I thank you for your service to the city. It is, is very welcome and your willingness to hear us on this, this matter. Uh, the matter concerning the, the noise that, that will be generated from this type of venue, we feel that it will not only interrupt and disrupt our church services that we have, but without a doubt will create and add concern uh, to the, uh, those around us. I think it, it may very well, as uh, Mr. Witt stated, uh, violate some existing noise ordinance laws that are on the books. Uh, for the other businesses and the residents in the area. Also the parking, uh, as has been mentioned, uh, this particular location that has been chosen does not provide at this time adequate parking and will without a doubt create a uh, concern for other neighbors by the overflow to adjacent parking areas. Uh, repairs to these areas are very expensive. Uh, the council, I am sure, is very aware of the maintenance on the streets uh, in the city of San Angelo and how expensive it is, and it will create an undue cost to the neighbors uh, of the surrounding areas. We do have uh, a, uh, an agreement with the, the veterinarian, and they help with costs, and we share in that parking lot, but it is full uh, e during his work days. Um, my last concern, and I, I have many more uh, that have already been voiced, but uh, the concern is, is also for the future. A change in zoning to accommodate a specific industry or to promote the sale of a specific property uh, sets a precedent that, that could create an atmosphere in the future 
for the established residents to find it intolerable, uh, something that they could not live with, uh, depending upon the, the nature of the business, could force them out of the neighborhood. I know that that's not your intent. And I, I believe um, that at this time, I would respectfully oppose the rezoning effort in this area and ask that it be denied. Uh, denied. Uh, I do appreciate again and thank you for your service to this community. Thank you very much. My name is Jim Netto, um, 3914 High Meadows, uh, single member, uh, single member six. Would you put, move that microphone just a little uh, closer to sorry. your mouth? There you go. <laughs> um, I was first introduced to San Angelo back in 1970 where I attended the Air Force Intel School. And I made a comment back then to my fellow airmen that I would like to come back here someday. Sure enough, the Air Force assigned me here for my last assignment in 1985. We found a quiet and safe place to live. <clears throat> when I retired from the Air Force, my wife and I decided we wanted to raise our family here. I worked at San Angelo Police Department while finishing my degree at ASU so I could be a teacher and taught at SAC and short-term Carver until I retired. In the military, in the San Angelo Police Department, and at Carver, I saw the damage alcohol can do to our San Angelo family. And I praise the, the council for having the Red Ribbon Week every year. We need to do all we can to keep our children protected from drugs. When we first arrived, we immediately became members of the Irving Street Church of Christ, which met at an old lawyer's office, which then moved to Colorado Street in, to a converted home. And finally, the men found the land, land where we presently meet at Green Meadow Church of Christ. We have grown, and the members, the family of this congregation, have helped so many spiritually and so many in other ways. If any of us would have ever thought this area could be rezoned to allow the sale of alcohol near our building, we would have never bought the land and built our church building there. It's a place we consider our home with our family in Christ. In this place, we can get away from the world and worship our God. It's not a place that should have parties and loud noise nearby. We hope you will consider the, the harm this rezoning will cause. Thank you. Yes, more public comment. The planning, <clears throat> two questions before I. Yes, sir. Uh, city planning. John's there right there on the front row. Right here. Right there. May, may I ask? Okay, if, just um, what you need to do, sir, <clears throat> is um, talk into the microphone, even if you're asking him a question, uh, then you. he'll come up. So you're addressing this audience with your question. Thank you. Uh, first, my name is Don Knight, and I live at uh, 6341 Indian Path here in San Angelo, and I attend Green Meadow Church of Christ, and I serve as one of the elders of that congregation. Uh, Planning Commission, can I ask uh, this question? Is the PD zoning the most uh, open that there is, or is there another zoning that could be even more open? Which, what do I do? Well, answer it now, and, um, and you might re-review at this point the conditions that the Planning Commission put on this request. Yeah, the uh, a plan development uh, is, uh, it's wide open in the sense that it gives the council the ability to approve and not approve conditions within the zoning as opposed to standard zoning like is on the property today the ordinance says you can do this and you can't do that, uh, and it's it's very limited. So a PD opens the door to allowing more things or allowing you to be more restrictive. So uh, it, it's it's hard to say it's it's not necessarily more restrictive or less restrictive. It gives you that opportunity, uh, and as as you mentioned, the the conditions here. Um, uh, place these conditions, in, including conditions on storage, uh, on hours of operation, on outdoor lighting, and requiring fencing. Uh, and so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you have the ability to, to remove any of these conditions or place additional conditions uh, on the property. Okay. Does that answer? My, my, my 
second second question is, are the if you'll the, talk to me, sir. The, Look me in my eyes and ask the yes, question. Yes, ma'am. My, my second question is, are, are the applicants required to build or use the plan they have already introduced, or could they even, after this zoning is might be passed, would it be possible for them to change that into something else? The short answer is yes, they're required to um, to develop generally consistent with this concept plan that, that you see on the screen. Um, now how the ordinance, the PD ordinance is worded, uh, any minor changes to that can be approved by, by planning staff. So if, if they move a building over or it's slightly larger or smaller, we can approve those sorts of things. If it's a major deviation from what they've shown you, they would have to come back and have the council approve any changes to that. Now, having said that, um, this concept plan is related to this proposal, uh, but the underlying uh, commercial zoning is still in place. So if they decide not to do this, what they're proposing today, they could come back tomorrow with some other commercial development that's already allowed today. Those types of developments would still be allowed tomorrow. So a restaurant, for example, uh, or some other use that's allowed under that current zoning, um, they could still do under that existing zoning, if that makes sense. Does that enter, answer your question, sir? Thank you very, very much. I believe that's uh, Mr. James. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Uh, as I said, my name is Don Knight, and I am uh, one of the elders at Green Meadow Church of Christ. Uh, most everything that, that, uh, that you have uh, uh, heard is, is quite important to us, and almost all the concerns will be or have been already addressed by other people. One thing that I am very, very concerned about if the city council allows this, uh, you'll be damaging uh, two or more businesses. Uh, the first business you would be uh, damaging is the the uh, veterinarian uh, clinic because of uh, uh, possible uh, lost revenue, because of the interruption of, uh, of people's pets. People have pets that they call their 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 kids. Does that uh, veterinarian do boarding? Yes, and that boarding is right next to that fence. And it would be very, very difficult to, to keep the noise from disturbing the animals in that, in that, in that clinic, in that boarding. Uh, the loss of revenue, uh, the employee turnover, uh, there's a lot of factors that we can't even see at this point that's going to be uh, effective and detrimentally uh, on these in these two businesses. The second business, of course, is, is Green Meadow Church of Christ. And the reasons are basically the same with one caveat. Uh, you'll be taking away our right to worship as we have worshiped for years and years in this city. I, have, I was born in this city, and uh, my family uh, uh, was, went to Ninth and Main Church of Christ for years. Uh, we became uh, uh, members of, of Green Meadow when it was Colorado Street Church of Christ, a uh, little converted house that uh, Jim told you about. Uh, we have had great times uh, uh, in, in, in with our brothers and sisters in these uh, uh, different places. It's it, it, it's a problem for me when when I look at the noise factor and the uh, the the use of of a piece of property that could be used for something else. Uh, I don't know how much these folks are spending, but it looks like to me they're going to have a four hundred thousand dollar at least investment in this when they finish up. Uh, I don't think that that $400,000 $400, investment is going to show a profit at, at the point with the parking and the areas that, that, that Thank you, you see. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you.
name is Hugh DeLong, 6248 Indian Path. I too am working with the, the church. I have been a professional musician all of my life, and I know playing outside venues simply require much more volume to overcome just the noise of the people that are enjoying uh, the entertainment. This is a self-defeating and escalating problem that you have. You have put the sound volume back to the church and to the vets that we have to then control by making complaints on the noise levels rather than being able to control that. If it was an inside venue, then that takes care of most of the noise problem. Putting alcohol into the mix of the traffic flow seems to me just a, a, a bad idea from the get-go. And the amount of parking already is a problem there. Uh, as Don has mentioned, uh, in the daytime, we already have much overflow into our parking. And again, you've put the onus of taking care of that back onto the church. We have to make the call. We have to call the tow trucks. We have to do the complaining on that. So rather than them being a self-sufficient business that you would control, you've put the control of those two problem areas back onto the church and onto the veterinarian clinic. So I would suggest finding a different business that can go under the current zoning that is there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Continue. I'm Lois Knight. Pull that microphone down, make it more comfortable. Never for you. spoken on a microphone or in, to anybody, so I'm scared to death. Please be patient with me. Uh, I have, I go to Green Meadow Church of Christ. I have been a Bible class teacher for 20, over 20 years there. And I know children are very distracted by noise and sounds they don't understand if there was sudden booming or, or whatever might come over a mic, it would frighten them. Little children are frightened by things they don't understand. And it'd be hard to conduct a Bible class when you're trying to calm them and teach them. Also, I'm concerned about this business being called a family entertainment, but nothing is really being put forth to entertain children. It's more about the adults. It's about the alcohol and the revenue that they can get from that. And it's about the music, the streaming music, the entertainment. That's not really about children. Also, the apartments, the tenants have not been notified. They just know it's up for rezoning. They don't know what. I think they're going to be blindsided. They're going to be trying to have family dinners. They're going to be trying to have, teach their, help their children with their Bible classes and, and schoolwork and have family time, TV time, cartoon time, but it's going to be drowned out by the entertainment across the street. And they don't know this is coming. And they have leases. They can't leave. It's going to be, it's going to be very hard on them. They might come home and find their parking space taken because public doesn't know what's theirs and what's not. They just see an empty parking place. They need to park. They want to go to the entertainment, and so they, they pull into a parking place. Might be my space in front of the church. I don't know. But I know parking is a big problem, and I hate for us to have to be involved in calling tow trucks and making enemies of this entertainment's customers. We, we don't want to have problems with, with our citizens. We don't want to have a, be thought that we're mean because we're not. We just want to worship peacefully. We don't want to have to argue with the citizens about who can park where. And we don't want to have to call because there's too much noise. And, and we just, we don't like problems. We like calm, we like peace, we like love. We love our neighbors and we want to continue to love our neighbors. So please don't rezone it for something that 
will just bring future problems for us. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Deborah Netto. Can you talk into that microphone, yes. please? My name is Deborah Netto. I live on High Meadow Drive. Um, I've lived in San Angelo since 1985. I'm a retired teacher from the San Angelo Independent School District. Um, I am a member of the Church of Christ that meets on Green Meadow. I'm also a volunteer and a foster for Concho Valley Paws. And all the issues that affect our church are first and foremost in my life. I'm also a, a client of Dr. Blanton's. Our family's dogs have been taken care of by Dr. Blanton, as well as our children's dogs that now that they've grown up, um, they've had surgeries at that clinic. They have been boarded at that clinic. And I know that the noise level would be so disruptive and detrimental to their health and uh, every patient that Dr. Blanton sees that that is also a great concern of mine. Um, the traffic, of course, the noise level, all of those things will have such a dramatic impact on this neighborhood that it would, it's very scary to think about the detrimental effects of this uh, rezoning request to me. And I respectfully request that you do deny this rezoning request. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm Dixie Kozad. I live on Walnut Hill Drive, which is in District 6. And my husband and I have met with the Church of Christ con congregation in Green Meadow for 13 years. I am opposed to the rezoning effort. I feel like most everything has already been said, but the most pressing uh, objection I have regards the sound issue. Our services are often interrupted by automobile noise from the loop and loud mu music being played from cars that pass us on Green Meadow. I understand the business being proposed on the corner has plans to broadcast music in the outdoor area, and I can't help but think that that would be distracting to our worship services. Also, as many have already noted, uh, I've noticed the lack of parking available for the proposed location. I'm sure visitors to the business will end up parking at Dr. Blanton's vet clinic and subsequently in our parking lot too. We have the underground water issues already that cause a great deal of problems with our lot and have had trouble in the past when residents of the apartment complex across the street have parked large trucks in our lot. Repairs to the parking lot service are expensive and frequent, and I would ask that the rezoning not be passed to allow the facility being proposed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, please come forward. Hi, my name is Jenny Black, and I grew up in San Angelo. And you I've want to talk into the microphone. Sorry, you can't hear me. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I grew up in San Angelo. I've always felt that it would be a great place to raise my family. I believe our city has Christian values and had put families first. But over the last couple of years, I've started noticing our city is changing. Um, we're trying to be more like our bigger cities. There are more bars popping up on Concho. We're allowing restaurants like Hooters and Twin Peaks to come to our city. And now we have the possibility of a family entertainment place that will play loud music and serve alcohol coming near where we worship at Green Meadow Church of Christ. I have many concerns that I ask you to listen to and consider before allowing this location to be rezoned for alcoholic beverages. The intersection of Green Meadow and Southwest Boulevard is extremely busy and at times dangerous due to the everyday traffic. There's also no traffic light. There's a lot of extra traffic coming from McDonald's and, um, and it's also prone to flooding. If this new business comes, there will be even more traffic and more possible dangers. Another concern would be the amount of noise that would be expected from this type of business. Their hours of operation would be when we meet to worship. Um, this could impact our Bible study and worshiping God. Even putting up something to reduce the noise levels would still potentially interfere with our church services. Lastly, I do not feel that this decision is best for our community. They are wanting to provide alcohol beverages in a neighborhood with apartments, daycares, and near a church building. If this place is to be truly family entertainment and focused on bringing families together, alcoholic beverages do not need to be involved, and hours of operation should not be during church services. 
I chose to raise my girls in San Angelo because of being a family-friendly city and for its Christian values. I would love to see our city going back to those values. My husband and I want our girls to be raised in a community that puts God first and doesn't put entertainment above worshiping God. Please do not rezone this location because it will interfere with our worship. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Further public comment? Council, Mayor, uh, Brian Benson, I am part of uh, the plan development concept that uh, we brought here. Uh, thank you for your consideration today. So let me explain some of this uh, from, from our side. Um, I've never been asked by one of the church members or if they contacted us about what our noise level, what our music is going to obtain. For when it sounds like we're bringing in rock bands, going to be really loud, that's not our intent at all. I mean, all we plan on doing is basically acoustic music under a tree right there uh, to just kind of give off some sounds similar like Bentwood on the patio, something like that. Um, I travel around quite a bit, see a bunch of different things and try to bring them here to, to San Angelo. I'm home builder, um, actually bought some land and did a PD just down the street last month that you guys approved. Um, we're gonna bring in some nice offices buildings right over there. This is an area that I think is, is, is very valuable to San Angelo and I think he's got some, some good stuff coming to it with McDonald's kind of moving up, more parking. Um, I think it'll do nothing but increase the value over there. As far as noise complaints, like I said, there's the, the fair, the carnival is over at the mall parking lot at night. I don't think there's ever been any protest about sound from it. There's the highway right there. Um, we're not looking at bringing you know, rock bands in. This is gonna be uh, music on the patio for like Friday and Saturday and maybe Thursday nights. Um, as I travel around here, like I said, what I've seen is that San Angelo is really needing somewhere to have a place where we can enjoy the weather. We have great weather nine, ten months a year out here, and there's very little place that we can go enjoy a meal, have room for the kids to run around, and if we want to, have the advantage to have an alcoholic beverage that that we're 21 and over can, can partake. We're not selling hard liquor. We're asking for beer and wine only. We're also trying to bring in entrepreneurships from the food trucks. I don't think there's a place here in town that offers a place for them to come, have one spot where they can, uh, they can, you know, we can provide a place for them to prosper their business as well. Um, like I said, it's already zoned C CGCH. If we decided to sell the food there, not have the food trucks, this wouldn't be this wouldn't be anything at all. I mean, all we'd have to do is ask for conditional use for outdoor space. As far as the traffic concerns. Uh, between what our concept plan has right now, we are at, I think, 16, 17 spots are required to have that. We have 26. We have 33% more parking spots than what would be recommended by our concept plan. I'd say there's not a whole lot of places in town that have 33% more parking than what even Mr. James just said, they were pretty, pretty good parking laws. Um, as far as the traffic on that intersection, that's not anything that we can control is, is trying to be business owners or property owners. That's something that, that you know, is, is, is the city's problem, um, you know, that we have talked about in the past as far as, like, we are putting a sidewalk in, so pedestrian traffic right now doesn't have a sidewalk. If they're going to be walking uh, towards the mall, there's going to be a, a sidewalk there that we've proposed to have. That would be safer for them than, what, than what's currently there anyway. Um, both in our original concept plan, when we only had the 15 spots, what wasn't noticed by city, if you'll see up here right on the, uh, kind of between the two curb cuts, there was four additional to have 19 uh, spots. They didn't see that at the time. I should have pointed that out to them, but that got denied after I pointed it out after the PD, uh, because they, they said in future use, this street could get widened out as far as also Southwest. So I think there's some stuff there with the city that, you know, if we bring something that has the traffic concerns, that that's something the city one would like to have and two you know that's something that they could address at the time there to either put a lot or widen those streets there um you know like i said we're just trying to to bring a concept here to san angelo and we're going to own the property that is able to you know take advantage of our outdoor space take advantages of like seriously when they, i mean i think fuzzies has really uh gotten popular because of their kid space and it's i mean it, it's just that astroturf out there that's 10 foot wide and 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 the length of the building and that thing's packed with kids and i think that's why people my age that have kids want to go there to eat 
They can, you know, have a conversation with some friends and their kids, you know, aren't always there or wanting to be on their phones. They're out playing. And that's kind of what we see. And I've, I've been to several uh, venues like this around the food trucks. Like I said, entrepreneurial, that's kind of what I am. And, and want to have, there's some good food trucks in town that have to, you know, especially with the new laws, um, you know, kind of have to be at certain spots and there's nothing that for them to kind of showcase their talents and we want to bring them all together and let them have this as long as like i said enjoy the outside weather and let the kids go out and play as we uh sit and enjoy it so you. hope you guys reconsider and i'll time's up yeah. so i'll get out of here unless you have any just questions. one second we have some questions okay, great. once lucy yes sir can you please explain what kind of family entertainment are you talking about so like i said we've we've talked about putting like some play structures up uh, a lot of that can kind of depend on where we are in our parking spot limitations. Um, so we, like sitting in that back corner back there, we plan on turfing everything. Is this, can I use this pointer? Okay. Oh. So all this area right there, we plan on putting AstroTurf down, artificial grass. Uh, we'll have some uh, like washer pitching deals, some cornhole deals. And it also talked about a play structure out here just for your kids to be on. Everything will be in full sight. There's not gonna be any unattended children. Uh, this patio will all be open. Uh, this area right here is like what we talked about, just doing like a, some papa shots, some uh, foosball table, stuff like that on indoor facility. Um, but everything's all inside. I mean, if you go to like Magnolia and Waco, I mean, they just, right there around their shop, you see they just have a huge deal of AstroTurf and there's kids playing on there all the, all the time unattended and they serve alcohol. And there's, uh, you know, just something like that where they can get out, they can run, they can play, we can put some balls around there. Um, and then, like I said, the, the play structure, due to insurance, due to some other things, are kind of hit or miss what we decided to do. They haven't finalized that. But, um, you know, I've seen some deals, Some the one in, uh, in um, uh, Bernie just had a huge, like, looked like a jumping net. It was just a kind of an inflatable deal on the ground with, with padding around it. And we stayed out there one night, and there is a food truck deal similar like this. And the kids jumped on that thing for three hours. I, never, we never, I mean, they were having a blast. And so there's just really nothing like that here in San Angelo that we can go watch it and we can enjoy it and enjoy the weather, have some, have some TVs on out there with sporting games on, and let the kids go run and play. Yes, uh, Tom, did you have a question? Yeah, Brian, did you have a question? I get what you're trying to do here, family and the whole thing. So my question is, what other places do you think this is the best fit for this? I mean, did you look at other places to go, and, and why did you choose this corner? Sure. And you had to know this coming in. There's going to be a ton of controversy. <laughs> We've heard from everybody. And, I mean, we're all, you know, we see both sides of this, and we're going to have to make a collective decision here. Sure. But I want to know why you picked this spot. Yep. So I looked around several spots. Uh, uh, Mayor, I've had a per personal conversation with you about the um, the the family – the. Putt -putt deal. Yeah. Yep, and looked at that, and I just didn't like the uh, didn't like what was already there, plus being leased and having restrictions. Uh, so I've looked around at this uh, for several reasons or several places, and I didn't find anything in town. I want to be close to rooftops where it's close, where you don't having people drive long distance. Uh, Uber, uh, Lyft now makes it more affordable for people that have, you know in the area to get there. Uh, I like the location because of how busy that location is. A lot of these are having to be forced because you need actually need an acre or so to ha to have this facility there, or having to go outside of the city limits. And and I mean, there's really not a place here in town in the, in where we want to be that that has this much space in, in right around rooftops. Well, I mean, trust me, we've all got tons of phone calls, and we're all for economic development. But and I will tell you this: as I look at this. From your standpoint, I'd say if you sat there, you realize you would be in an environment where your neighbors would be against you. We don't. We definitely don't want to be against this. I think there's a lot of misconception out there about what will be. I mean, we're, you know, like I said, one, music Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, their church is going on mainly Sunday mornings. We're open Talk at 11. Talk about the hours because that's a thing that kept coming yep. up. Uh, obviously, church is on Sunday. What hour of the day do you would you project opening on a Sunday? So 11 a.m. on Sunday, just so, you know, we can get in there before, you know, football games, stuff like that come on on Sunday. So 11 a.m. on Sunday, we're not going to have any, any live music Sunday mornings, obviously. Like I said, our, our live music, and which would be acoustic music from what uh, my thoughts are on it anyway, are going to be Thursday, Friday, Saturday night. Um, 
other than that, the only really noise that we'd have would be any TVs that we have that are out under pergolas or something like that that would be around, but I don't see the volume of that affecting someone that's 500 feet away. Um, you know, parking, like I said, we've got 33 more, 33% uh, more spots than what is, is being recommended there. Can we sit there and tell people, you know, I mean, yes, we can try to monitor it as best we can, but obviously before they pull in, I don't know, you know, where they park, but we can also try to do that. You know, I, other than kids running around and playing, I don't understand the, really the, the disturbance of the animals next door. And we've, we've sat down with Dr. Blanton and we've talked to him and, and we've even asked him for a shared parking agreement. And the, really his only reason for turning us down was for, uh, if for resale value on that. He didn't want to, to tie down his property with that, with that requirement on there. And, and we understand that. And, uh, but I think it's something that we'll promote. I mean, I think it's something that will, uh, we also have the letter of, 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 uh, of, favoritism is our neighbors across the street so it's from reflections i mean uh they are in favor of of us bringing something good to that corner i mean that building's about to crack in half if you guys look there's a two inch crack in this building that i've circled over here uh, if you'll look on the building that's coming across there from the parking spots it's wavy like this there's lots of water damage there i mean if we look at this uh we've already got quotes from from uh uh, structure engineers of what it's going to be. There's not going to be a whole lot to Harry's point. There's not going to be a whole lot of people that want this property, and that's why it's set vacant. It's got issues. Um, you know, does that help property values? I don't think so. If it sits there vacant and, and basically falls down, I um, think it would cash flow if you couldn't sell alcohol. I mean, I, th I think it really hinders it because basically, like I said, we're not making. We're going to rent to these spots these food trucks. Um, and basically, you know, we're selling beer and wine, but we're going to sell Cokes. We're going to sell water. We're going to sell tea. We're going to sell Capri Suns. I mean, we're going to sell all the beverage, at, at, you know, not let the food truck sell anything but food and let us sell all the beverages. Uh, do I think we're really a bar? Not really. I mean, I think we're more of a restaurant, but we're not serving the food. They are. Again, I think if, if you added their food sales in here, that beer and wine would be less than probably 30 percent of all sales your food's going to be your majority of the sales it's just not we're not the ones selling the food again that's what goes back to i mean we if we bought this property and we take out the food trucks and we do our own food we have the same problems that we're still talking about right here the only thing that we're adding is doing letting food trucks be like be an entrepreneur let them have a place to where they can shine and that they're better at cooking than i am <laughs> so I mean, that's really our only deal here, that the difference from what it can currently be to what, it, what we're proposing is the food trucks. So, Brian, are, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but based on Tom's question, if you could not sell <clears throat> the, the beer or wine, mm -hmm. you wouldn't do this. Is that, is that a fair statement or not? I think it'd be I, – I, yeah, I'm – Personally, probably yes, because I just think because your margins and everything else that you see, you're probably going to be making money off of this on your beer and wine sales. Um, is it still a viable business at that? I don't know. I think it's something you'd have to charge more for your food trucks and everything else. else. And then can you also get people there and get people to stay longer um, without having the beer and wine? Would they look you at going somewhere Talk else? about your overall hours for example yes, church services on a wednesday night will you be open on wednesday nights or what are you opening every day at 11 a.m yes but what we propose right now and like i said we don't have this set in stone this is just something that would give us a range that we could you know we could operate in for sure whether we needed to adjust or not but it was opening every day at 11 a.m uh which i think really the only days we're looking at open at 11 a.m were saturday sunday saturday and sunday uh, and then 3 o'clock, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then, like I said, be open only until 1030, until Sunday night till Wednesday. And then just keep it to the possibility of having it to 12 Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Like I said, any music, I, uh, we talked to Jeff the other day. He was asking about, you know, according to the noise ordinance, I thought we had to anyway is, is shut down any kind of music or anything like that at 1030. And he said, well, if we can, we put it in there. Uh, this was just Friday, and I know he was out out the rest out after that. But yeah, I mean, I thought we had to abide by that anyway. So any music that we have will be down by 10:30 that night anyway, because I thought that's what the nor nor noise noise ordinance was anyway. Um, like so, said, you wouldn't be having music on Sundays. 
no. one way or the other, and it wouldn't kill you if you had to open up at noon on Sunday, not 11 a.m. Sure, yeah, so church that's services fine. Services would be over. Yep, yeah, that's fine. And really, they said the only reason we'll would do 11 is just to kind of get open before some of the church crowd gets there before the football games start at noon on Sunday. But really, like I said, looking at this more for you know. We're looking at music for three days a week, not really. It's going to be more outdoor TVs, what games are on, things like that, than, than what we're going to have. We're not going to have bands. We're not going to have drums. We're not going to have bass guitars. It's not going to be amplified music uh, that, I, that I foresee anyway. Lane, did you have a question? I do, and this might be a John question. Um, it seems like the plan development is just based mainly around the sale of alcohol. And I know your margins would go away if that went away. What if it's BYOB? Does that fall under the CGCH? Is that allowed currently? So if they went well, the liability in, issues, you have liability issues with that, and then you also that. have profitability issues. So um, I understand the liability portion of it, but what if they wanted this to work and it's riding on the okay development, the plan development for? Do the allowing of the sale of alcohol, beer and wine. Um, if it is just BYOB, those margins go away for them. But like Brian said, it, it, that would allow them to stay a little bit longer if the adults want to bring a cooler. And we'd have to look into that. That's uh, the that's probably somehow in the TABC rules that I just don't know. I'm not familiar enough with that uh, and how that might. In other words, it depends on the TABC permit and their right. rules, which our zoning ordinance links to. And so uh, we'd have to look into that, and that's a question we haven't yet researched. What would your other revenue streams be? Because, I mean, I, here we are. You've got a business plan. We don't have a business plan. And we're trying to rewrite your business plan. And um, that's pretty much hard to do for us to do that because we're fair. not the investor. Right. We're not the one having to live with the numbers. How else would you even earn income? I mean, that you have to get down to it's not a business if you don't have an income stream. Sure. What's your income stream sure. without beer and out wine? Right. I mean, like I said, to just be straight beverage sales plus rental for the food trucks um, that, that we rent there. Other than that, I mean, what little bit, I don't know what we were having to really look, but what income you'd get off of your arcade games in there, like your Golden Tea, your Pop Shop, I mean, which is minimal. Um, so unless we came up with more ideas of selling, you know, just having little stuff like having booths around there to sell to sell stuff, or or say you had, uh, you know, just one little concept I've seen is have um, like little casitas or pergolas, whatever, out there and just rent. Hey, you can come. There's a group of ten. It's, it's tables, twenty five bucks or something like that. I mean, I, I don't know. I just think that without nickel and dime them to death. I mean, I think this is where we go, that we build we build this. And like I said, still staying to this deal, but with these building problems, I mean, we may come back with a concept that still keep with this footprint, but it's gonna be demolishing those two buildings there and building something nicer and newer uh, to improve that corner right there. That's more feasible for that. And then having, you know, like I said, uh, just some, some things, some plant some trees to have more shade. I mean, things like that around in here. John, let me ask you a question. Then Harry, I'll let you talk. Okay, so let's say that I'm thinking outside the box. So what happened if they destroyed those buildings and built a building and put in a concession stand within that square footage inside that arena, that area? They own the space. They lease the space to concession. Is that then a restaurant? Because if it is, they can then sell beer and wine because you got a restaurant inside the facility, even though it's not owned by them as a concession. No pressure. That's a well. That's a tough one, and I would hate to give an answer now because I, that's just a question we haven't uh, looked into. Um, I, I think it's a fair point that they basically got a restaurant, but the restaurant piece of it is farmed out to a third party. That makes their permit, uh, you know, an alcohol bar type permit. Um, but I think uh, the way the TABC rules work and how our zoning links to that. Uh, my guess is that would they would still have the same issue. Um, you talked about if a restaurant wanted to open up there, a restaurant could, I'm going to open up a restaurant there, I'm going to serve beer, wine, and alcohol, and I am going to serve food because it's a restaurant. That's legal. That, that's so correct. So with that being legal, 
right now if they opened up a restaurant inside that complex and then leased it to somebody it's still a restaurant facility and but somebody separately had the beer and wine again that's that's going to depend a little bit on how TABC views that because they're the ones who issue the permit and make the distinction between a, a restaurant permit and a beer and wine. Because I think we, you know, here's the complex part of it. It's a fine line between what he wants to do and what we're talking about today versus somebody tomorrow coming forward and getting a permit to put in a restaurant that serves beer and wine. And, you know, it's a really thin hair here. Quick, just so the zoning ordinance states that if they qualify for a food and beverage certificate, so my understanding would be if someone leases out the space and they were serving the food, they would have to be the applicant to meet the food and beverage certificate license from TABC. So his wife could do that. I'm just asking. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, sure. And, and one other thing just to bring up here, um, Lubbock, uh, I have a couple businesses in Lubbock, and they just opened a little Woodrow's up there, which is similar to this. It's more of a more of a full bar, but similar to this. And I know Lubbock mandated that they serve food. They had to serve food in there. They had to have it. They had to serve food. Food trucks still come up. I mean, it's 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 a little different. Food trucks still come up, and they serve food in there. But Little Woodrow's is required to serve food. I think they have pizzas. I mean, they serve like pizzas, and nobody buys them. They're not any good. They're a little bitty, but they're they're, but they're required. Serving. They're required to have that. So, so the only thing uh, the only thing that there that that would change is that obviously if you do that, we had to put in restaurant equipment. We'd have to be health certified as as fully as that goes, and that's just something we have to look at. Does the sale of our our little food offset what it costs to actually put in a full restaurant? You know, and then it could, and then it could be something that that maybe that's beneficial because maybe that gives a commissary for the food trucks. You know, I mean, it's, it's something that we could definitely look at. We're open to ideas. We're not trying to be a bad neighbor. We're not trying to be a big bar that's going to you know outsell Blaine's or any of that. We want to be a good neighbor. We want to just bring a family atmosphere. Where, like I said, if I want to go out with a couple of our couple friends and we all have kids that are eight to ten years old. There's nowhere we can go and want to sit and visit with them for a couple hours and where our kids aren't constantly on me. And like I said, we have great weather here in San Angelo. And I go to other places. Uh, like I said, Bernie's one. I went to one in Dallas a couple weekends ago. Uh, they're popping up everywhere. They're getting popular. Is these kind of facilities where the kids can go, they can have a good time. Uh, just for an example, the other day, uh, last Saturday, a couple Saturdays ago, when Dish was having their dispute with Fox, they didn't have the Tech football game on there. So after our, our kids' sporting games in the morning, that game starting at 11, we went to shenanigans just to have lunch and watch part of the game. They had a square where they, they have their corn uh, their cornhole in there that's a 10 by 10. There was 15 kids playing on that square of grass running around while everybody was in there. And that's because there was nowhere else for them to play. It's needed. The kids love it. Uh, it, and then, like I said, I want to take advantage of the outside weather here in San Angelo and bring something that this city needs. I mean, as we're growing, military people have hit us up about I mean, they see them a lot of times. Um, it, it, it's something that I think is obviously needed or there wouldn't be this much people. Like I said, the parking is the biggest concern to me more than any of it. Harry, you had a question or comment. I have a comment. <clears throat> Three weeks ago, I was in Fredericksburg, and I was really surprised. I hadn't been there in a couple of years how many children were at some of these wine tasting places. The parents and their friends were out having conversation and the kids were off in, in the grass area playing. So the concept, I think, is not foreign. It may just be foreign for San Angelo. Having a place where the family can go and let the kids play, take some of that energy that they've got, and still have an opportunity to sit down and enjoy a beer or a glass of wine, I think really is, is something that you're going to see is going to grow in this particular community. Now, maybe this is not the right place because it's near the church, but I will say this particular property really needs to get some tenants in there so we can put it back on the tax rolls. We've got so many empty properties and buildings in this, in this community, and, and, and if you've got a concept that works, a business plan that works, we really need to take a look at it. All right, do I have further questions or comments? Yes, please. Thank you. My name is
name's Brittany Ionita. I'm a realtor with ERA Real Estate. I'm also um, part of the development with Brian on this um, concept. Um, I feel like um, there's obviously a lot of misconception on our plan. Um, you know, anytime, as Brian's mentioned, uh, we'll, I will go out um, to meet some friends and they bring their children. Well, if we go to Outback, we go to Texas Roadhouse, any of those locations, the kids are on their phone the entire time. There's no place right now in San Angelo other than downtown with a little putt-putt for kids to actually go and be kids. Um, you know, we've got an epidemic that kids sit home and play video games. We want to make sure that we're giving them the opportunity to run and play and meet new friends at different schools that they may not have actually gotten a chance to introduce themselves to before. Along with that, just having the family environment, selling real estate. Um, I'm actually, I live on Green Valley, so I drive up and down Southwest every day. Looking at that building, it's an eyesore. Um, the owner of the building does not want to do anything to it. The, there were other businesses at one point that were trying to um, purchase the building, and it would have been the same amount of traffic. Um, you know, again, given that I'm a real estate agent, I do actually have a lot of inside information as far as what businesses would have gone there or were attempting to purchase. So um, we feel that our concept is great. There's a lot of families around there. We've had letters of support from families in the neighborhood surrounding that, um, surrounding the business. So, you know, I, we really feel that just Creating taxable revenue for the city is important. Getting rid of vacant buildings is important. Um, you know, the families that I service and assist buying homes that are new to San Angelo, the number one question is, what is there for a family to do in San Angelo? The movies, maybe some putt-putt, and that's about it. So we want to make sure that we're supporting not only local businesses, but local families and giving them the opportunity to actually go out and enjoy, again, like Brian said, the weather and just each other. So thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Any further public comment? Yes, sir. to clarify the the hours of well hours of operation or services of the church uh, the church normally meets on Sunday morning 9 30 to about 12 30 uh, it also meets Sunday evening from 6 o'clock to about 7 30 uh, during Wednesday it is 7 o'clock through uh, through 8 o'clock but during the week we have uh, two evangelists that study they're, they're working from their office there. We also have teachers that come up there to study, to prepare their classes on and off during the week. We currently have a gospel meeting that is going on, uh, and we have that several times a year, which will last uh, 7 o'clock to 8.30 at night. Uh, so uh, that's Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays besides the, the, fr the sa Sunday session. So I just wanted to clarify that it is not just a, a one-time thing that we're in there and, and worshiping we're we're in there it, it's it's not a business it's but we're doing the Lord's business is what we feel and uh, and, and we're encouraged by that uh, just to comment if uh, speaking of families and 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 families being together we welcome anyone to the church anytime they they want it's a good family place thank you thank you Gary, would you like to make well, a comment? I guess, I guess I'd like to have the applicant come back up and have a conversation. Uh, the church elders have said they've, they've talked about their hours of operation. I understood him to say that they were not having music except on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Is that correct? Yeah, like I said, it's something that we'll have there I, I, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, maybe if the 4th of July was on a <coughs> Tuesday, we might, you know, I just it was a special event like that, but mostly, and like I said, we're not trying to. I don't think they'll ever hear acoustic music under a tree, um, or what, where they would, if they could hear us, then we've got something really being being ex extremely loud, from what I, I would think. But I don't know. I've never been inside their building, so I'm not sure. Are the acoustics going to be amplified by speakers or just straight? Acoustic. No, like I said, if you go to like Bentwood on Patio, they have a little one of those little amplifiers just with maybe acoustic guitar. Or radio. Yeah, and like I said, there may be a radio or the game. Say we had the games going on the outdoor TVs. I still don't think that would be, you know, with the divided fence with the highway right there. If that gets projected over there, it's 
seems to be it would be extremely loud that we need to turn it down at that point. Yes. Harry, did you have further questions on the hours? I so no further questions on hours, just, Lucy. Not on hours, but I just want to know how far is the church from where your 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 building is? Well, it's um, if you actually measure from this corner to this corner, it's about 180 feet, but we went off TABC guidelines and from our entranceway right here all the way over and up to their door, it's almost 400. And we're not trying to disrupt the neighborhood. We're trying to enhance the neighborhood. Um, again, we've had a conversation with Dr. Blanick. Um, you know, again, his biggest concern was the parking. Um, but, you know, again, we're trying to do everything we can, eight-foot privacy fence, you know, making sure that any lighting was shielded. Again, hours that were would work with his business. I, on Sundays, he's got some pickup um, times in the, later in the evening, I think until 5. But, again, we're going for a family environment, not a race bar by any means so with that being said we don't feel that our patrons are necessarily going to be there till 10 30 till midnight but we want to make sure that we have the hour availability in case we do better than what we think we would there's a, for parking reasons too there's always also like a little they it's not freelance they can't drive straight from there to there uh, there is a little curb cut deal right there, and, and we talked with uh, Councilwoman DeWitt about, you know, landscaping that, putting a fence right there so it's not easy. Basically, if they park over here, they'd have to walk all the way around, and I'm not opposed to that, you know. Um, we're not, I don't want to promote it. We don't want to make it easy for them to, to access anybody else's parking from over there. Most people want to park as close to the entrance as they possibly can. Yes, Billy, you want to um, make a comment? Just um, for clarification, um, Dr. Blanick in his letter not only was concerned about the parking, but he was also concerned about the disruption to his animals that are boarded overnight, as well as with there being food that kids would have the opportunity, or maybe adults too, to throw food uh, stuffs over the fence where his dogs are boarded. So it, you know, he, his letter was in strong opposition to this uh, rezoning. So I just wanted to make that clarification because it sounded like Ms. Onita, from your conversation with him, he was okay, but the letter he wrote indicated that he was not okay. It's too bad he's not here to speak because everyone's it, quoting him and I don't think that's quite fair Correct. in either case. Well, positive letter, or negative. But. His letter, Mayor, is yes. in the packet. Yes. Okay. So I think he was very clear in his opposition in his letter. And he said he would, he told me he would try to make it if he could. Yeah. And I'm assuming he may have had some vet business that sure. didn't and, allow him. And again, I mean, he's a very busy man. And um, obviously, there can, can definitely be some misclarification in conversation. But um, it was about a week and a half ago, two weeks, that we spoke to him. So I'm not sure when the letter came in. Um, one thing to note is there is a easement down right on the side of his property. Um, he actually owns that right now. It's extremely overgrown, um, brush, et cetera. There's a ton of garbage in there um, currently. Um, so again, as good neighbors, we would want to make sure that we were maintaining that. It would be far-fetched, I believe, if somebody were to throw food or b beverages or anything. I mean, I can't, I'm not going to say it wouldn't happen, you know, but obviously, you know, that's part of us being business owners, being in charge of not only our staff, but really making sure that we're keeping tabs on any guests that does frequent our building. And I don't know where those outdoor, I mean, looking over there, I'm not sure that there's much outdoor space on that where we had this red line right here, uh, like I said again with our eight foot privacy fence to have food thrown over that plus the easement into a cage. I, I hadn't, I mean, like I said though, that chain link fence, we can go back to the pictures, but I don't, I don't see any outdoor kennels right there on that deal. I'm not sure where they are. I've never been on the inside there though. Okay, um, with that, John, I'm gonna ask you one more time to go back to the slide um, that shows the conditions that the Planning Commission put on this. Okay, so on the hours, it says hours until 10.30 p.m. on Sunday through Wednesday and 12 a.m. Thursday through Saturday. What it doesn't designate is opening time. It, it does in your packet. This was a summary. Just uh, to make sure everybody... Yes. 
and so it's it's 11 a.m. Oh, that's supposed to be 11 a.m. Uh, but yes, that, they would not. The revised information in your packet says that they could not open before 11 a.m. And let's see, was there anything else somebody brought up that's not in these conditions that you had questions about? Harry, did you? Tom, Tommy, Lucy, Lane. Uh, John, just to clarify though, CG zoning, it sounds like this can still happen as is without going to plan development. They might have to tweak a little things internally, but. Well, the big thing is the food. It's Ooh. possible that they could figure out a way to make it work in terms of get, if they were able to get a restaurant permit. Um, and there, there might be some limitations on the outdoor entertainment that they couldn't do under the straight zoning. Uh, but, yes, it's, it's very similar to what they could do. And that's one of the reasons staff recommended approval, and I think the Planning Commission as well, is that um, the current zoning is CGCH, which would allow... Um, some things that might be considered more obnoxious, some uh, you know, truck repair, auto, automotive kinds of uses um, that could be allowed under that under the current zoning. Okay, Billy. Okay, do I need to restate my motion? Or well, I we think good? the motion was to deny to deny the PD since they can do this under the current zoning. Yes, they can't do it under the well. They current can't do zoning. everything without some tweaks to it, but. Um, that there is some opportunity for them to make adjustments. So that's my motion. Is that correct? Yeah. Again, it's it's questionable whether they could do, I think it's fair to say they couldn't do everything they want to do uh, without the plan development. They could get close and they would have to work out some, they would have to become a food service establishment as well to be able to not need the uh, beer and wine only permit. All right, so there's a motion to deny a second by Harry. All in, no. I mean by Tom, Tommy, sorry. With that, all of those in favor of denying say aye. 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 All in favor say aye. 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 To deny. To deny. To deny. No, to deny. not the first question is to, are you voting to approve denial? Okay. Do you want to deny the right to make this a PD? You want us to hold our hands Aye. up? Let's hold our hands. Okay, so the denial is one, two, three, four. Those who approve the Planning Commission's recommendation for approval say aye. 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 Motion denied four to three. Or motion approved four to, to three. Right. Two deny. <laughs> two deny. All right, we will move on to item C, consider adopting an ordinance authorizing the issuance and sale of City of San Angelo, Texas waterworks and we sewer system. Small break. What? Um, small break. Okay, small break. Uh, it's 11.15, be back at 11.25. If everyone could sit down, please. We're trying to have a meeting here, please. Okay, with that, we're gonna to move to item C, consider adopting an ordinance authorizing the issuance and sale of City of San Angelo, Texas Waterworks and Sewer System Improvement Revenue Bonds Series 2019, establishing procedures for the sale and delivery of the bonds, providing for the security for and payment of such bonds and authorizing and enacting other matters and provisions relating to the subject. Tina. You're up here more than anybody on an ongoing basis. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Good Come morning, on. Mayor. Go Council. for it. Thank you. Um, this is the Texas Water Development Board um, revenue bonds that we'll be issuing. You approved our application for this process a few months back. We've been working through that process with Allison and with our uh, debt council and financial advisors. Um, so the amount that we ended up uh, issuing for was just over $56 million with a term of 25 years and an interest rate, which is wonderful, of zero point. Say that again. Zero point yeah. four seven two percent. So, and the, of course, you know the uh, the purpose is for the expansion of the Hickory, Hickory Aquifer project, the well fields out there. Um, I do have with us Vince Vial from Specialized Public Finance and Rudy Segura from McCall Park Hurst and Horton. If you have any questions from either of them, and of course Allison is here, and um, I've asked her to give a brief summary of what the project entails. 
Well, I think a 0 .472 interest rate makes everybody interested. <laughs> yes, I agree. So with that, I'll ask Allison to just come up and give a, a brief um, overview of the project so that the public is aware of what we're doing. Our other most favorite female, <laughs> Allison, who's up here all the time. Well, thank you, Mayor. Um, this is for the expansion of the Hickory Aquifer to the full production capacity of 12 million gallons per day. Um, it's, we will be looking at drilling five additional wells out on the four branch. Um, there will be booster pump uh, capacity increases, um, as well as the expansion to the groundwater treatment facility and ultimately the new clear wells going in uh, where all of the water is chlorinated and sent out to the distribution system. So we're really excited about this project and also excited uh, about the extremely good interest rate. Do, um, does anyone on council have a question or would like to make a comment on this item of borrowing the 56 million at 0.472 or not borrowing sorry i said that wrong any questions any comments do i have a do you need a motion to accept do i have a motion Move. to accept second any public comment No public comment, we'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 None opposed, motion passes 7-0. Um, just FYI, item G has been pulled. If anyone is still in the audience <coughs> waiting for item G to come forward, know that item G will not come forward today. It will be moved to a November, December meeting. All right, then we're gonna go to item D, first reading a public hearing of one, an ordinance approving CP19-02 an amendment to the comprehensive plan changing certain lands from the neighborhood future land use to the commercial future land use, being the east 5.9 acres of an unaddressed 11.3374 acre track located approximately 250 feet west of the intersection of Sunset Drive and YMCA Drive, and two, an ordinance for Z19-15, a rezoning from the heavy commercial CH zoning district to the general commercial CG zoning district being an unaddressed 11.3374 acre track located approximately 250 feet west of the intersection of Sunset Drive and YMCA Drive. Thank you. Uh, John James, Director of Planning and Our Development Services. Our most favorite Services. guy coming forward again. We're getting a lot of favorites today. Um, as you mentioned, this is a comprehensive plan amendment and a rezoning. Uh, here's YMCA Drive and Sunset. Uh, you can see the railroad tracks here. Uh, this is a vacant property that uh, is rezoning for an office use. I believe it's they're looking at like a dental office, uh, that kind of thing, but it does require uh, basically por a portion of the property you'll see on the next page is um, the boundary between the commercial and the residential uh, was right through there splitting this property. And so it's rezoning the, uh, the I guess, the easternmost part of that property, uh, changing the designation from commercial to I'm sorry, from residential to commercial and also on the zoning, uh, it's currently CGCH and it's taking it to a, um, a lesser zoning district that would allow for that office top use. Uh, just some pictures of the area. Again, it is a vacant uh, tract just down from the hospital. You can see the uh, industrial top use across the street uh, and this is at the property and you can see some of the apartments in the background. So we think an office top use is a good transition from you have single family homes and then you have those apartments this would be a small scale office type use and then you have the railroad tracks and heavier commercial on down from that um, staff is recommending approval uh, here's some of the rationale for the approval i won't read through all of these uh, but it as i just mentioned uh, it, this does make an office use does make a good transition uh, from that existing neighborhood over to the more uh, intensive commercial over toward the medical and, and hospital area uh, that's off to the west a little bit. Uh, we did send out our notifications, did not receive any responses either in favor or in opposition. The vacant land didn't apply? Didn't reply? No, <laughs> no. I'm just thinking. Although those do have owners that could have a concern. Um, as I mentioned, staff is recommending approval of both uh, the conference of plan and the rezoning. Uh, Planning Commission also unanimously recommended approval. With 
that I'll be happy to answer any questions. Do we have questions? Yes, Harry. Can we take both these motions at the same time? I believe so, yes. Move to approve both the comprehensive plan and the rezoning. D1 and 2 in a second by Tommy. Any public comment? With no public comment, we will take a vote. All in favor, um, say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes 7-0. I mean 6-0 because we've got one gone now. All right, so we've just done C, D, and we're going to go to F. First reading and public hearing of an ordinance approving the abandonment and vacation of a 20-foot wide by 190-foot long, 0.0872 acres, 3,800 square feet, north-south alley located within Block 30 of Angelo Heights Edition. Thank you. Again, John James, Director of Planning and Development Services. This is an, uh, an uh, alley abandonment. Uh, you can see here uh, it's in an undeveloped area. The alley was never constructed, uh, and the property owner owns uh, all of these properties. At some point in the past, this property off to the east, uh, por portions of it were split off. So what were left were three little remnants uh, of, ex of lots that had originally been platted out. Uh, you can also see that there's some floodplain, floodway uh, issues there. Uh, this is the uh, the river running through, uh, and this is basically to abandon a non-existent alleyway uh, so that this property owner can consolidate uh, that into a larger property by replatting. It is a combination of uh, comprehensive plan, uh, partly neighborhood center, partly neighborhood, uh, and it does have a, a zoning of, in this immediate area of uh, the zero lot line twin home residential. You can see a uh, portion of the alley uh, is is used to some extent, but not for uh, any you know, any public service or anything like that. And uh, as is typical, you can see that the property drops off uh, down to the river there. There is. Uh, that east-west alley is used sporadically, but there's no evidence that that north-south alley is used for anything other than parking, uh, so staff is okay with the abandonment. Uh, there are no evidence of public or private utilities. Um, that would be addressed when they do go to replat. We'll send out notices to all of the uh, utility companies. If there is you are utilities in the, in the area, they'll have to accommodate that either by moving the utilities or maintaining a utility easement. Uh, staff does recommend approval, as did the Planning Commission uh, unanimously. Uh, we do have our normal conditions of approval. Uh, they pay the formula that's identified by ordinance, um, uh, obtaining a quick claim deed from the city uh, that would allow them to then replat the property, uh, which is condition number three, uh, replatting all of those lots uh, to incorporate the abandoned uh, portion of the alley. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Do I have questions from Council? I move to approve as presented. And a second by Lane. Any public comment? With none, uh, we'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion passes 6-0. <laughs> that leads us to item H. Consider resolution authorizing the city manager a designate to apply for and accept a Texas Historical Commission certified local government program grant for fiscal year 2019 to 2020 for a total project amount of $35,000 approving provision for matching funds equal to 50% of the project costs in the form of a combination of matching funds and value of in-kind services and designating the city manager as the city's authorized grant official. Uh, again, as, as you just read, this is uh, authorization for staff to apply for a certified local government grant, which is the program through the Texas Historic Commission it gives grants for historic preservation. Uh, this would be the first step in establishing a historic overlay district for downtown, uh, and it would hire a consult allow us to hire a consultant with the grant funds uh, to do the research necessary uh, to then follow the paperwork and do all the documentation for uh, establishing that downtown district. Uh, as you mentioned, it, it would be a $35,000 project. It's a 50-50 match, uh, so the state provides 50%. We would have to provide 50%. However, a portion of that can be in in-kind services, so the staff time that we spend working on the uh, assisting the consultants would be these in-kind services, so that wouldn't be actual uh, outlay of funds. It would just be staff time and 
photocopies and those sorts of things. Uh, but then we would be asking for the $10,000 uh, of the actual cash uh, matching funds uh, if and when we do uh, get selected for the grant. Do I have uh, questions or comments for John? Move to approve as presented. Second. Second by Lane. Any public comment? With no public comment. We'll take a vote. All in favor say aye. Aye. Motion passes 6 0. Tina, you're back on again. I update on sales tax revenue performance. Thank you, Mayor. So I have good news here again, um, and that number is not right. No, it's 2.94%. I'm not sure why the slide hasn't been updated. I'm sorry about that. Um, in October, compared with the same month in the prior year, but it is uh, $69,000 over our budget for revenue year to date. And we do have your industry information here with, um, looks like all industries are seeing a slight increase for September, other than ag, which was down about $20,000. So. They need rain. Yeah, they do. So, if you any have questions? any questions, I'll be all right, that completes Thank the you. regular agenda. So we will move into closed session, executive session on the provision of government code, Title V, Open Government Ethics, Subtitle A, Open Government, Chapter 551, Open Meetings, Subchapter D, Exceptions to Requirement that Meetings Be Open under the following sections. A, Section 551.072, to deliberate the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property. If deliberation in an open meeting would have a detrimental effect on the position of the governmental body, negotiations with the third person regarding the Mills Paul Edition, Block 24, 1521, 1525, South Concha Park Drive, 141.670 plus acres out of WCRR Co. Company survey and 200.1100 plus or minus acres out of West Johnson survey. B, Section 551.0891, to deliberate regarding security assessments or deployment relating to information resources technology regarding Evolve Agreement. We will be adjourned for closed session. It is 11.42. We will be back here um, at 12.42 or earlier. And we will call this meeting back to order. And as it relates to uh, items discussed in closed session, I'm going to let Lucy start. I make a motion to approve an agreement with A. Baldy. I'll second that. Any public comment? With none, we'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 None opposed. Motion passes 6-0. And then uh, there's another item, Lou. Uh, I think that, Billy, you were going to discuss that, please. Yes, I'd like to make a motion, Mayor, to extend the deadline for recurrent energy to gain access to the substation to December 31st, 2019. Thank you. Do I have a second? A second by Harry. Any public comment? With no public comment, we'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion passes 6-0. Are there any announcements in consideration of future agenda items? Remember, our next count, uh, uh, council meeting will be November the 12th. Is that correct? That's correct. And also, just a reminder to the citizens, we do have the special election November 5th. With that, do I have a motion for adjournment? We adjourn. And a, a double, double, double. <laughs> and so with that, all in favor? Aye. 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 Six, zero. The double, double.